Hey, good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone's faces. It feels like it's been a while. I hope everyone has had uh, a great uh, summer so far. And uh, welcome to our Community and Protective Services Committee meeting. Uh, I will call the meeting to order. Um, as you know, of course, this meeting is being held by Zoom, which is necessary in these times of physical distancing to keep everyone safe during the pandemic. Uh, please note, if you do not need to participate in the meeting, you can also watch it on the live stream uh, to the Ottawa City Council YouTube channel. A reminder to participants to please keep your microphone muted, muted until I call on you to speak. And we'll see how many times today we have to remind people to mute or unmute. It's always a, a challenge. Um, I will provide each committee member with the opportunity to ask questions and comment on each item. Uh, in order to do so, uh, I ask that you use the raise the hand function in Zoom. I'm sure we're all familiar with it by now. Uh, committee members will be uh, called upon first uh, for any questions and then any other members of council who may have joined as well. Again, the raise the hand function is at the bottom um, of the participant list. For attendees, you will find the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. For those calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand as well. Uh, the committee coordinator and I will uh, do our best to watch for those cues. And as usual, the five minute uh, limit does apply. Uh, members are also asked uh, to submit any motions, uh, visual supports or declarations of interest in writing to the coordinator at their earliest convenience. And uh, although the deadline has passed for residents to speak at this committee, Resident, residents may still make written submissions uh, prior to council on August 26. If anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties, uh, either signing into the meeting or throughout, uh, you can contact the clerk's office at committees at ottawa.ca or by calling 613-580-2424, extension 28821. So before we get started, uh, just a few thoughts on the agenda uh, before us. Today we have an important uh, continuation of the discussion that council started last year. As you likely remember, uh, committee and council approved the regulatory framework for rental accommodations. And this was in response to concerns that I think we all shared around the increase in short-term rentals in our communities and concerns on the quality of rental housings, low vacancy rates, and growing need for more affordable housing. So the approval of this regulatory framework set the path for staff to develop the regulatory regimes for both long-term housing and short-term rental accommodations. And this morning we're considering the new rental housing property management bylaw, as well as new pest control regulations. So we know from the data that a very small number of properties, about half of a percent, caused 23% of complaints. And 32% of the complaints are due to pest issues. So the draft bylaws that we have before us will allow us to make progress in areas uh, that were identified as priorities for all of our communities. And I believe that the regulations in this report will improve the overall quality of rental units in our city. Uh, before uh, we begin and, and we get into the work we have before us, I did wanna thank uh, our community and stakeholders that have engaged with city staff, have engaged with many of us uh, throughout this process. Um, it's because of this involvement um, and because of the hard work of many, and I know, uh, you know, Councillor Luloff and, and Councillor Elshantiri have motions that they'll be introducing today that I think are a result of many of that, uh, many of the discussions and efforts that have been made in the last uh, little while, that these motions um, are tackling issues that I think are important and uh, will improve the way uh, that this uh, bylaw moves forward. 
So I also want to take a moment to remind my colleagues and the public that discussions on landlord licensing are out of scope for this report. Uh, this has been discussed at our previous meeting and has already been voted on by committee and by council. And lastly, I did want to take a moment uh, and the opportunity to thank both Valerie and Jared uh, and the whole team at EPS who have really worked tirelessly and under very challenging circumstances right now uh, to bring forward this report. Uh, I know it's been a tremendous amount of work and I'm really pleased that we're here today as a result of their efforts. Uh, also on the agenda, we have a number of uh, commemorative naming proposals, uh, the Accessibility Advisory Committee's work plan for this term of council, uh, as well as uh, NIPD to consider. So with that, I think we'll start perhaps with roll call. Uh, and if I could ask uh, Mark to run us through that. Indeed, Councillor. Um, Councillor Elshantiri. I see him there. I'm here. Conseil Fleury. Fleury. Councillor Luloff. Present. Councillor McKenney. I see she's there, but just a picture. <laughs> Councillor Meehan. Here. Councillor Eglai. I think he's a bit late. Yeah, I believe he's just running a bit late this morning. And Chair Suds. Here. <laughs> Terrific. I'm Thank here you now too. Much. I think you yes. saw me in the <laughs> Sorry. Not to worry. We saw your picture behind you and your name. So <laughs> excellent. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? Nope. Seeing none. Uh, so the confirmation of minutes, are the minutes uh, for the meeting of June 18th, 2020 confirmed? Confirmed, excellent. Okay, I'm going to run through the agenda. Uh, I'm going to hold the first item for obvious reasons. We have some delegations and a presentation on that item. Uh, the second item as well I'll hold as we do have a delegation on that item as well. The third item, commemorative naming proposal for the Julie Dunnigan room. Carry it. Yes, carry this one. Thank you. Um, on the fourth item, commemorative naming proposal for the Laurier, Laurier Carrier Park. Carried. There's no submissions or requests to speak. Carry it. Carried. Carried. Fantastic. Uh, on the fifth item, commemorative naming proposal for Sandy Ruxtahill Gurdians. Uh, again, uh, no request to speak or submissions. Is this carried? Carried. Okay. Carried. Excellent. On the sixth, commemorative naming proposal, Steve Bunk Administrative Building. No I wonder if it's a family member of Radic Bunk, a former Ottawa Senator. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but. <laughs> so let's, we can carry that one as well. Carried. Yeah. Carried. Excellent. And then uh, number seven, seven, another commemorative naming proposal for Wren's Way. Does this carry it? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, number eight, commemorative naming proposal again for George Brancato Park. Okay. Carry it. Okay. Fantastic. Excellent. And so with that, uh, we'll go back to the first report. And uh, as I mentioned, we do have a number of speakers on this uh, delegations is on this today as well. Uh, but prior to that, we will start uh, with a presentation by staff. So I believe um, I'll ask uh, Mr. DeMonte and his team uh, to, to do this. Merci, Madame la Présidente, and uh, good morning, committee. I'm joined today for uh, the presentation by Valerie Bietlo, our manager of public policy development, and uh, Jared Riley, who are, is our bylaw specialist. And they both led this file. And as you mentioned, I too want to thank them for their uh, for the yeoman's work that they've done on this file for, for council and committee. 
Before I turn over to Ms. Bietlo, I'd like to uh, take um, a bit of uh, time just to reorient everyone um, as to the journey we've been on together. This is the second report of the rental accommodation study. And you'll recall that the first report approved by council in 2019 set out the regulatory framework and approaches for both the long-term rental housing and the short-term rental accommodations. Uh, today, we're coming back to you with the proposed regulations for the long-term uh, rental housing. Uh, this report presents a proposal, uh, a proposed rental housing property management bylaw, as well as enhanced pest control regulations as directed by council in the policy approaches that you approved last November. Please note that the third report dealing specifically with the regulations of short-term rentals like Airbnb and Expedia remains on track um, uh, despite the challenges that have arisen with the ongoing pandemic. Uh, staff have got their, their heads down and uh, we hope to bring that forward uh, um, in, in a timely manner. Committee members will recall that extensive uh, process that led to this point, including the comprehensive research and robust public and stakeholder engagement that was undertaken for the rental accommodation study. And following the approval of the regulatory framework in November 2019 by you, staff have continued to work with key stakeholders to develop the specific regulations presented for your consideration today. With that, I'll turn it over to Valerie Bietlo and Riley to, um, to discuss uh, the specific measures contained in the recommendations of the regulations. Thank you very much, Mr. DeMonte. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, today we are recommending two things, a new rental housing property management bylaw, as well as specific pest control amendments to the existing property standards bylaw. And collectively, these regulations will introduce five key measures to improve the quality of rental housing across the city. Our overall approach emphasizes prevention and the measures are aimed at increasing communication between landlords and tenants where property standards, property maintenance and other key issues around rental housing quality are concerned. These measures will help resolve issues on site without or before the need of a city intervention. They'll also provide more accountability for landlords and tenants where non-compliance does occur and with additional enforcement tools when necessary. Les règlements recommandés préconisent la communication entre les locateurs et les locataires et um, sont en vue de régler les problèmes liés à la propriété avant qu'une intervention de la ville soit nécessaire. En particulier, le nouveau règlement sur la gestion des biens locatifs prévoit également une plus grande responsabilisation des locateurs et des locataires en cas de non-respect des règlements. I'd like to very briefly go through the five key measures that are included in our regulations. Next slide, please. The first proposed measure is a requirement for a capital maintenance plan for all rental buildings with three or more stories or 10 or more units. The plans are a vital preventative tool. Um, these multi-unit, multi-story buildings are, have more complex maintenance needs that arise and uh, they require planning and more financial resources to repair or replace vital equipment. When problems do occur, for example, in apartment buildings, they can have a severe impact on housing quality and a higher number of residents can be affected. Capital maintenance plans, as we propose them, will be, will be require property owners to inspect, to plan for, and to keep on top of the condition of their buildings, including specific requirements to monitor essential infrastructure, such as accessibility features, electrical and mechanical systems, fire escapes, and balconies. Capital maintenance plans will not be required for individual rental homes, basement apartments, or smaller private home conversions that don't have these same complex systems as larger buildings. Nous proposons que les locateurs doivent établir un plan d'entretien pour tout immeuble locatif de trois étages ou plus ou de dix logements ou plus. Ils devront inspecter leur immeuble, planifier un plan d'entretien uh, planifier des réparations et répondre à des exigences, exigences particulières en matière d'infrastructures essentielles, telles que les dispositifs d'accessibilité, les systèmes mécaniques, les sorties de secours en cas d'incendie et les balcons. And as an enforcement tool, 
uh, building owners will be required to produce proof of these plans on request to an enforcement officer. In addition, offenses have been created for non-compliance by the landlord and by the tenant as necessary with escalating fines for repeat offenses and daily fines for recurring offenses. Next slide, please. The second measure is set standards for how landlords receive, receive, log and keep tenant service requests. We know that most landlords have processes addressing ten tenant service requests already. However, input we received during the consultation phase of this study identified that a small number of properties generate 23% of all enforcement actions related to property to rental properties. During the course of this study, we spoke to tenants who didn't know how to contact their landlord or had to make repeated requests for property maintenance issues. Conversely, we also heard the frustration from landlords, in some cases, who first learn about a maintenance issue when a bylaw officer comes to their door. In an ideal situation, a tenant's first call should be their landlord, and the problem should be resolved without city intervention. We're therefore recommending a process for landlords to receive the complaint or service request, to respond to the tenant, to take steps for remediation or repair, and to keep a written record. Service standards for landlords to respond to tenant service requests are also recommended in our report. For any issue that impacts the ability of the tenant to live in their unit, so urgent issues, a 24-hour response time is recommended. For issues that are less severe, a seven calendar day time period is recommended. I want to note that these standards don't require the landlord to completely fix the problem. However, the process has to have started. Enforcement and remediation of underlying property standards and property maintenance issues will also continue to be possible under existing bylaws. Le règlement proposé prescrit également des normes de services spécifiques au niveau des plaintes des locataires. Les locataires devront recevoir la plainte, répondre aux locataires, entamer ou exécuter les mesures correctives nécessaires et conserver un dossier écrit des réparations effectuées. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, uh, back to information for tenants, please, Mark. Thank you. The next measure recommended by staff is the requirement for landlords to provide an information for tenants document containing key information for tenants needed to prevent or to address common causes of complaints and bylaw violations in rental properties. Every tenant would be provided with contact information and instructions for reporting problems to their landlord or property manager. Landlords would also be required to inform tenants about their right to report problems to the city and would have to provide service Ottawa contact information. The information for tenants will include site-specific details, such as instructions for on-site waste management, property maintenance, and lawful parking where appropriate. This measure really emphasizes prevention with a focus on issues that drive service demand. Selon la troisième mesure, Les locataires devront fournir aux locataires des renseignements précis dont ils ont besoin pour prévenir ou corriger les causes d'infraction et des plaintes courantes. Par exemple, chaque locataire recevra des coordonnées et des instructions dont il a besoin pour signaler les problèmes à son locateur ou à la ville. L'information requise devra aussi comprendre des renseignements propres à chaque logement, y compris des instructions pour la gestion des déchets sur place, l'entretien de la propriété et le stationnement autorisé. Next slide, please. The fourth measure recommended by staff is the requirement for landlords to maintain an essential assistance, uh, a special assistance registry for tenants who voluntarily disclose their need for a special accommodation. Landlords have an obligation under provincial legislation to consider requests for accommodation and may be, may be required in certain circumstances to provide an accommodation. While the city does not have a role to play in determining if an accommodation is warranted or appropriate, our recommendation that landlords keep a registry can help ensure that tenants know how to access assistance if they need it. Next slide, please. The final recommendation is the implementation of an integrated pest management uh, process in all rental housing. Insect inf infestations account for 23% of property standards requests from rental housing. 
and a further 9% of requests involve issues with rats, mice, or other vermin. Integrated pest management is an ongoing process that aims to reduce the overall frequency and the severity of infestation. This process would require all landlords to have an integrated pest management plan for their properties, including standing treatment plans for bed bugs, cockroaches, and other common pests. These plans would require both landlords and tenants to cooperate on prevention by maintaining building units and buildings uh, to keep them free of conditions, which might encourage infestations. All landlords would be required to monitor their properties for signs of infestations, and tenants would have also have an obligation to report infestations or conditions that could cause an infestation. We do know that when an infestation occurs, landlords and tenants have a shared responsibility to implement the pest control plan. While landlords are responsible for treating the pests, treatment is really only effective if tenants properly prepare and manage their units for treatment and then follow post-treatment instructions to prevent reinfestations. So we're recommending a follow-up inspection that would be required between 15 and 30 days following a treatment. This is the optimal window to assess the effectiveness of treatments for uh, insect pests. The integrated pest management approach for rental housing would help us move to a proactive prevention-based model with specific accountabilities for both the tenants and the landlords. La mise en œuvre de la lutte anti-parasitaire intégrée pour les logements locatifs permettrait à la ville de passer à un modèle de prévention proactive reposant sur la délégation de responsabilités précises pour les locataires et les locateurs. Next slide, please. Madam Chair, I would like to outline where today's discussion fits in the overall framework for rental housing that was approved by Council last year. In December 2019, Council approved a $500 property standards reinspection fee, which has been implemented uh, by bylaw and regulatory services, and two temporary enforcement officers uh, have been created. Upon approval of the bylaw and regulations uh, by Council, work will begin immediately to develop educational and support resources for landlords and tenants to be provided on Ottawa.ca, including sample plans and templates that uh, landlords can use and information for tenants as well. We're also working on a searchable, publicly accessible online database for property standards violations that will enable residents to search a five-year history of property standards violations at any municipal address. Finally, staff are recommending that this new bylaw and related regulations that we're recommending today only come into force on August 30th, 2021. This provides one year for landlords to prepare. And this timeline is being recommended after consultations with EOLO, with Ottawa Community Housing and the Community and Social Services Department. So Madam Chair, this concludes the presentation and we look forward to your questions. Madame la Présidente, il me ferait plaisir de répondre à vos questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Valerie and, and Tony, for your remarks as well. Um, so we do have, I believe we have 11 speakers uh, registered uh, on this item. Uh, it, I think it would be beneficial. I, I believe at this point we have uh, two motions related to this item. I think it would be uh, beneficial if we could uh, table those now so that everyone has an understanding of, of what's being proposed. Um, so could I ask um, Councillor Luloff, maybe I could pass to you, are you able to read out the motion and, and maybe I can ask uh, the clerk to also put it on the screen for everyone? Yes, Madam Chair, I have it in front of me now. Fantastic. Would you like me to wait for the clerk to get it up? Yeah, let's give Mark just a second. There we go. Wonderful. So this motion is, is in response to some of the suggestions that were provided to us uh, by ACORN. Uh, and we've worked with staff on this one. Uh, they are supportive of it. 
therefore, be it resolved that Section 8 of the proposed Rental Housing Property Management Bylaw be amended by adding the following subsections to create a record of a tenant service request when requested by the tenant as follows. Um, I think this is supposed to be A. No landlord or property manager shall fail to provide a written record of a service request to a tenant within 30 days if such a request is made by the tenant when they submit their service request to the landlord or property management uh, or B, the record of a tenant service request must include all information prescribed under subsection 1B. Terrific. Thank you very much, Councillor Luloff. And the other motion that I have here is uh, by Councillor Al Shantiri. Again, if we could have that up on the screen and if you don't mind reading it out, uh, Councillor El Shantiri. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Would you like me to read the whole motion? As you know, it's a long motion, so you need to uh, bear with me, but this is basically the standard for delivery of updated information for tenants. So if you like, I can read where the as is, or I can skip the where as is and just go to the bottom, uh, 16, one, which, whichever you like. I think uh, because we are doing this virtually and for those following along uh, online, uh, I'll, we'll bear with it if you don't mind and read out the entire thing this okay. one time. <laughs> Absolutely. Whereas the proposed rental housing property management bylaw requires landlords and property managers to deliver information for tenants, document to tenant and to obtain the signature of the tenant to, to show delivery of the initial document as set out in section 16. And whereas the proposed by law also that require that the landlord of, or property manager deliver update or revise information for tenant document to the tenant and obtain a signature to confirm recipient. And whereas the requirement of, for obtaining the signature of the tenant on each update information for tenant document may be overly uh, onerous on for the landlord or property manager from both a particular and cost perspective. And this requirement may not be required. And whereas also uh, particular to consider additional method of delivery of the documents by the landlord to the tenant over that registered mail or clear delivery in uh, circumstances where the tenant refused to sign the document to confirm recipient provided proof of recipient as obtained to show the document was actually delivered. Whereas also particular to uh, suspect that with respect to section 32 of the proposed bylaw, the landlord or property manager was also obligated to post a treatment plan in the building when the publicly accessible area of the building that are being treated other than a rental unit. Be it resolved that section 16 and section 32 of the recommended rental house and property management bylaw be amended as indicated by the following body wording and skill up. So, and we can scroll, okay. Uh, 16, what, oh, sorry. Okay, two copy of uh, information for tenant shall be provided with the lease agreement. A, one copy must be provided to the tenant and B, one copy must be signed by the tenant as acknowledgement of recipient and retained by the landlord with the lease agreement. Two, when information for tenants are, are modified, the landlord or property manager shall A, issue revised copy of the tenant in accordance with the subsection four within 30 days of the modification and C, replace the copy uh, kept on file with revised copy. Three, where a tenant refused to sign acknowledgement of recipient of information for tenant as required in subsection one B, landlord or property manager might issue copy to the tenant in accordance with the subsection four and retain proof of issuance. Four, for the purpose of subsection two A and subsection three issuance of the information for tenants document or revised information for tenants document might occur by the following means. A, registered mail 
with appropriate recipient of delivery. B, courier delivery with appropriate recipient of delivery. C, personal service to the tenant with the recipient of delivery signed by tenant. D, personal service to an adult in the, in the tenant's rental unit with the recipient of delivery signed by the adult in question. Personal service to the tenant with the affidavit of services. F, personal service to an adult in intense rental unit with an affidavit of services or G, email or other electronic transmission with a proof of delivery to the tenant. No landlord or property management shall fail to post notice of the pest treatment plan in the lobby of the apartment building when the treatment is in a building area accessible to tenants other than the rental, uh, rental uh, unit. So this motion, ma'am, to make sure there's, there's so many options to make sure the landlord or the property manager can deliver those to the, to the tenant. And, and I, I think this motion covered most of those we heard from, uh, uh, fr from the Eastern Ontario landlord and from our folks uh, who's been involved with the report. Excellent. That's Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Elshantari. Are there any other motions uh, that anyone would like to table at this point in time? Okay, seeing none, and I believe, um, I haven't checked my email, but I believe those have been circulated as well. If they haven't yet, they're on their way. Um, so we'll move now to uh, delegations. As I mentioned, I believe we have 11 delegations this morning on this item. Uh, first up, I will invite uh, Mavis Finnamore. Uh, and just a reminder as well, uh, there is uh, five minutes uh, allocated and I will give you a, a one minute warning. So Mavis Finnamore. Oh, there we are, excellent. We'll just get you off mute. And Mark, are you able to assist with getting off mute or is this? Okay. Oh, there we are. Terrific. Uh, Mavis, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow councillors and other interested participants. Thank you very much for having us to give our deputations. Hello, my name is Mavis Fenimore. I'm a long-term tenant in Ottawa, having lived in Heron Gate for over 30 years. Out of watching Heron Gate go downhill in less than two years and facing eviction in 2015, I and other tenants saw Acorn's help handling ongoing tenant problems, such as lack of repairs and widespread bug problems. From these collective experiences came tenants' requests for reform, which we passed on to the city, and they have obviously made it into some of the recommendations proposed by bylaw staff. While a landlord registration system would have allowed for proactive enforcement of these new bylaw measures under consideration and added to the budget for property standards, these new proposals are positive steps to ensure every tenant has a safe and adequate housing. I am pleased to see such things as landlords having capital maintenance plans and mandatory plans for treating and preventing pests. As a major complaint of tenants, this was sorely needed. Another feature I like is the introduction of strict timelines for responding to tenants' requests. Finally, there will be rules to get work done promptly. I was also pleasantly surprised and glad to see mentions of accommodations for people with disabilities. Another major improvement I like is the information handbook for tenants that can show them how to escalate unresolved issues with the city. As a tenant and ACORN member, it was very obvious that many tenants did not know their rights and the obligations of landlords. Now, while these recommendations are all good, I can see they can be improved. For example, pest infestations. If you've ever suffered from them, you know they can be very uncomfortable to put up with and even dangerous to one's physical and mental health. 
and they should be considered among urgent tenant requests. That's the 24 hour period. I've heard some real horror stories of people having to wait weeks for bug treatments with families going to bed each night only to be bitten by bed bugs. Now I'm sure none of you would want your families to go through that. The call should be immediate to whichever accepted firm has the shortest wait time to set treatment appointments. Don't go waiting seven days, forget that. Another area of concern are the uh, forms for service requests. Tenants need their own copy to back up their claims of service requests. In my case, I needed these forms to prove my request when I had to go to the landlord tenant board and I had to get services completed. Not all of us have perfect recall of dates and descriptions, and these forms can help support tenants who have language difficulties or do not have home internet as well. Presently, all the proposals from bylaw staff state they would be implemented in 2021. And I think that's way too long to ask people to wait for better services. While making the mandatory plans might take time to develop, Surely some items like timelines for pest control could be implemented in less than three months. You know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are forced to be indoors a lot. And I think bug problems, mold and other housing issues coupled with lack of affordable housing make a lot of lower income people like myself feel trapped. One minute since we can't move away to get away from these problems. I also feel that if these proposed bylaws had been in place when I lived in Heron Gate, it never would have been allowed to deteriorate to the point of eviction and demolition. I don't want another Heron Gate in Ottawa or elsewhere. It hurt to be pushed out of my home. So implement and improve the laws to help tenants, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mavis. I appreciate uh, you participating today and, and those uh, remarks. Are there any questions uh, from the committee for Mavis? Okay, oh, Councillor McKenney. Sure. Hi, sorry about that. I was slow on the hand raise. Hi, Mavis, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I just have a quick question for you in terms of tenants moving into new accommodations and um, in your experience with ACORN and, and working with, with tenants, mm -hmm. um, what is the experience um, that you can tell us of tenants moving into units that have infestation already uh, in place of bed bugs or, or you know, rodents, what, any type of uh, pests? In certain areas, it's actually pretty common. Uh, I came from Heron Gate, and of course, there was more than one eviction there, uh, 2015 and 2018. And we had some cases of people who were evicted in 2015, moved across the road and into some very, you know, quick movements and they found that they were put into very dirty units that were already infested with bugs. And this was pretty devastating to them because they never had them in the old ones. And they really had no choice because they had no place to go. There was right. no choice. And unfortunately with the city of Ottawa, uh, with Mr. Ford, they've reduced their choices even more for where they're supposed to go. So um, when they got evicted again, um, you know, they, they kind of keep running into the same problem. And it makes it very difficult for a person. I just want to mention one thing. If you think bed bugs are not a big deal, imagine not being able to go over to your friend's house because your friends are afraid that you're going to bring bed bugs. I have that situation where I can't have friends in to, because I know they come from a home with bed bugs. So this is very difficult socially for them, they can't even get out of the house to see their friends because they've they've got this big problem that follows them wherever they go. And once bed bugs get into a place, they're very hard to eradicate. I have a friend who's been through this process three times. He's had to throw out furniture. He's had to throw out bedding. 
And I remember the last time he's also disabled. He called me and he said, who can I get to help me get rid of my stuff? No one's there. And he was crying on the phone to me. So this isn't uncommon to have it happen more than once, particularly, as I said, in an area that is already getting reinfestations and they're not handling the pest control property to begin with. It's spreading. Okay. And this is a big issue. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's something that I'm concerned about that uh, I, I want to be able to talk to staff and ask staff about uh, later on. So I appreciate your, uh, your perspective on that, Mavis. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor McKenney. Any other questions for the delegation? Uh, Councillor yeah. Meehan? And then we'll go to Councillor Luloff. Uh, Jenna, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Matt had his hand up first. So I'll go after Matt then. Okay, very well. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Luloff. Thank you, Councillor Meehan. I appreciate that. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so not only uh, are, are we requesting uh, now, uh, Ms. Finnamore, that uh, you receive a copy of, uh, uh, of your service request, but also that uh, a receipt is provided. Do you feel that um, this will address the concern that you've, raised, that you've raised today? Well, I'll tell you a little bit of my experience. I didn't even wait for your laws. When I marched into the office to get service, I demanded I was not leaving until I had a photocopy of the whole thing. And I would sit on their desk until until they gave it to me. I appreciate your tenacity. Simply because no. I was aware of the frustration of this. So this is why I don't see this as a really big deal. Just give me a photocopy of the order. I'll be happy. I have a record. You have a record. We're equal. And if ever I'm in any trouble and I have to go to the landlord tenant board, boom, there's my evidence. You know, for people, we, especially in Heron Gate, had a lot of immigrants, a lot of people with some language problems. When they would go into the landlord tenant board, I saw this, they could be very easily confused by the lawyers on the other side. And as soon as you start doing that in that situation, you've lost your case. They think you don't know anything. They think you're an idiot. So you do have to provide some of this for people to show proof that you actually are on the level and that you made it at this time. This is really important. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Luloff, and now Councillor Meehan. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mavis, thank you for being part of this presentation this morning. I just want to um, lean in on your experience a little bit. Uh, you say that 2021 is too late in order to bring in some of these, uh, some of these bylaws. Um, when it comes to bed bugs, we, uh, is your experience that we cannot possibly just uh, deal with one rental property. It's got to be an entire building, right? Would, would you say that? Um, well, it, it, from what, my experience a long time ago, when you had bugs, they would treat the whole building. Yeah. But bed bugs are a little bit different than dealing with cockroaches. Bed bugs are really insidious and can hide in the weirdest spots. Uh, my brother was in a residential retirement home and they found it hiding in the top of the curtains. No one even thought of looking there until they wanted to clean the curtains. Um, and of course, as I say, if you're going from one area to another that has bed bugs, you may not even realize that you're transporting it. Like yeah. you may not realize, I understand the public library is alive with bed bugs. And of course, we also know of the scare that uh, government offices had when they discovered they had bed bugs too. And it was certainly noticeable by me that they were all set to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean that, but you don't get that same kind of support necessarily within residential apartment buildings, especially low income buildings. So it becomes like an insidious sort of thing. I told somebody it's like whack-a-mole. They would go in, treat a place, and then they would leave. And of course the bugs being smarter than us would just move next door for a while and then move back in. And we were hearing that this is how it was spreading through the whole building. Yeah. You were only treating one. And at, let's be truthful. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of treating bug treatment. There doesn't seem to be one standard way of treating them. So it made it very easy for, you know, anybody to basically say they could go in and treat something, but 
there was no way really of measuring whether you were successful unless you're suddenly your whole building was full of it. I, I understand why we are waiting for about a year in order to, to introduce these bylaws because we need to allow the tenants, or sorry, the landlords uh, time to, to organize themselves and, and uh, adhere to many of the rules. But I know from the studies that we've done uh, that there's only a small percentage of, 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 of buildings that are responsible for uh, many of these, these pest issues. I'm just wondering, and I'm just putting this to staff, is there any way, because I really take Mavis's uh, comments uh, to heart, that we are asking people to stay at home longer. There's children that are home, uh, you know, for longer periods of time, that if there's any possible way that we can speed up uh, the pest part of this bylaw, that we can actually get the landlords who are responsible for a small percentage of these problems to adhere to, the, to these new rules much quicker. Um, treat these problems uh, so that we can protect uh, people in their homes. That's um, that's just my suggestion, and I thank Mavis for this. One other thing you said on the shortest list. So we know that the companies that are dealing with this problem are um, they have a long list of clients who need help. Would that is that what you're suggesting? That there, how this long before you get a company that's going to come in? Well, this is what I've been told, but I do not know of any evidence that even suggests this. Okay. Uh, they say there's a variety of companies out there doing things differently and plans do change according to the bug. Um, so I, I really don't have a true picture mm -hmm. of how bad it, I've been told that, uh, you know, you have to wait weeks because they're booked up. I don't know that. Or, okay. or are we only just, you know, dealing with a few companies? Are we not looking at the whole picture? Are we not getting people in from maybe just outside town? I think we should be exploring this more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my suggestion is if we could speed up the pest part of uh, the pest component of our new uh, bylaws. Um, I really don't want to think about people, families and kids going into the winter. We're asking them to stay home longer to stay out uh, and having to deal with this issue. So. Um, thank you. That's it for me. I've, I've seen the bed bug bites on the children. I hate to tell you that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Meehan. And we will, after we go through the delegations, we will go to staff for questions. So we'll have the opportunity then to, to ask those questions directly of staff. Uh, not seeing any more hands. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mavis, for joining us this morning. Uh, next, we have Ray Noyce. Is Ray with us? I do not see He's, Ray. He's uh, joining us by phone. Uh, okay. By phone. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, oh, fantastic. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Ray. You have five minutes. All right. Uh, good morning, councillors. My name is Ray Noyes. I've been a tenant in Ottawa Vanier since 2001, and I'm a member of ACORN, but today I'm speaking on my own behalf. I'm reasonably happy with some of the contents of the two new bylaws, but I'm here particularly to speak about some of the amendments I would like for pest control, and some of that's been touched on already, uh, so there might be a little overlap. Um, it should be a requirement that landlords not rent out units to tenants that they know to be infested with pests. Tenants should not have to deal with that problem when they're taking on a new apartment. And when no one, um, and when no one is there, it should be much easier to do treatments and take care of the problem. Landlords should be required to use professional pest control companies, and there should also be thresholds established for when to treat neighboring units or whole floors or entire buildings. This is important because bugs tend to spread from unit to unit as uh, the last speaker was talking about. Another major concern of mine is that pest problems should be treated with urgency. This would mean, for example, that when a problem is reported, it should not be left for seven days, but the process for dealing with the problem should start within 24 hours, even if it is not possible to arrange immediate treatment. Now I can speak to the bed bug issue on a personal basis because about six years ago, I suffered an infestation of bed bugs that was bad enough that it caused a case of severe anemia. The main symptom of this was extreme shortness of breath and I was hospitalized because my red blood, my red blood cell count was very low. I spent four days at the Montfort Hospital undergoing tests to determine how I was losing blood. 
All these tests proved negative, which narrowed the cause down to the bed bug infestation and the amount of blood they were consuming. I required blood transfusions and iron infusions over several weeks, actually many weeks, and I was warned by the nurses that any exertion could bring on heart failure in my condition. In the end, after seven treatments by a pest control company, the bed bug population was reduced enough that I began to recover. However, at that point, the landlord fired the pest control company, leaving the job incomplete. Fortunately, the problem did not recur badly enough to bring on another case of anemia. By all this, I simply mean to indicate how seriously dangerous bed bugs can be, aside from the obvious psychological torment that they cause. Now, in conclusion, I understand that staff believe an integrated pest management plan would address the urgency issue, but to be clear again, I'm suggesting that in the process of dealing with a bed bug problem in particular, uh, meaning uh, I'm meaning to that uh, responding to the tenant and calling the pest control company to schedule treatment for a later date, these are the steps that should begin uh, within the first 24 hours. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ray, for sharing that. And uh, sorry to hear of, of your circumstances. Um, I am looking for any hands, any questions uh, for the delegation and not seeing any. Uh, so thank you very much, Ray. I suspect we'll have questions for staff in this regard coming up uh, after the delegation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, so next we have Norma Jean Quibel. Have... She doesn't appear to be on uh, council, uh, chair. Okay. So we'll move on uh, to the next delegation, Megan Wiper. Oh, here we are. Okay. Just get Megan unmuted. There we go. There so we go. Have... Yeah. Okay. Five minutes. Right, so Megan. hello. Hi. So uh, my name is uh, Megan Wiper, and I've been a member of ACORN since August of 2015 and was recently elected uh, co-chair of the Ottawa Venny chapter. The reason why I, jo I joined ACORN in the first place was because my landlord wasn't, doing, wasn't willing to do any repairs at all. Uh, for example, there was a lot of uh, water damage, uh, particularly in the bathroom with plenty of mold and mildew. Uh, we also weren't allowed to turn the, the thermostat above 19 degrees in the winter, so we were completely freezing. And in the summer, we had a, a big uh, fruit fly problem. Just before I moved out, they were supposed to replace uh, the flooring in the bathroom, but all they did was put new tile on top of the old tile because that was the cheapest way to do it. Anytime I had issues with my unit, I had to deal with my landlord face to face which rarely came to any fruition. And I couldn't follow up because there was never any record of our conversation. This is why it's so important that there, there be processes to receive and follow up with tenants requests in writing. We also have ACORN members though that don't have cell phones to text or, or home internet to write and receive emails. So landlords should also be required to give tenants written receipts of any service requests. We are happy to see city staff incorporate this feedback into the recommendations. Recently, myself and my roommates have had to cope with cockroaches. Uh, the problem is that Paramount Properties uh, just puts down some powder and a few traps rather than going through a professional pest control company. For a while, the cockroaches did disappear and th then they came back again. So it's basically just a stopgap measure as it's not getting it's, it's not effectively getting rid of the bugs. I see them in the bathroom and sometimes on top of the kitchen cupboards and even in our microwave. Needless to say, my roommates are frustrated living with pests. It's even stopped me from inviting friends over because I don't feel comfortable because of the stigma that comes with that. A paramount gives us the impression that it's our fault as if we're not keeping the place clean enough was is simply not true. We keep things as clean as possible, but they keep coming back. But we're also scared of calling Paramount again because we don't want them to just blame us for a problem we didn't create. I moved into this place December 1st, 2019 and spotted cockroaches very shortly after in the microwave, I believe about a week after actually. I've never had a problem with cockroaches before. So it's safe to say the cockroaches were there before I even moved in. I like to know from city staff how 
The pest control bylaw will help ensure that tenants like me don't unknowingly move into units with, with existing problems like cockroaches. These are all common problems for ACOR members who tend to be lower income tenants. We're low, we're low wage workers, people with disabilities, students, newcomers, and single parents. And these are often the group of people who landlords tend to take advantage of. Well, we're disappointed that this committee voted against a pilot project of a registration system to, to proactively catch and resolve problems. We believe that these bylaws are a big step forward to ensure tenants have safe and adequate housing. We have an opportunity right now to make these bylaws as strong as possible for tenants, especially during a time when governments are telling us to stay home. These bylaws could be made stronger by requiring landlords to start the process of responding to reports of pests within 24 hours. This would mean a minimum replying to the tenant and calling a pest control company to book a treatment for as soon as possible. Restricting landlords from renting out units known to have pests in them and requiring that they hire professional pest control companies to eradicate the problem, having central tenant notification boards to keep tenants updated on service disruptions, capital repair projects, pest control activities, and how to call the city if needed. These are very important changes that wouldn't require much of the city, but would make a huge difference in the lives of tenants. One minute. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you very much, Megan. I appreciate uh, you being here and sharing those comments. Uh, I'm not seeing any quite, oh, okay, Councillor Fleury. The, I believe, Madam Chair, the, that the speaker did have a question for staff wondering on the report. I, I wonder if we could get just staff response to, to the concern that was raised so that we know if, if additional questions uh, need to be asked for, uh, for staff. I wonder if staff can respond basically. Okay, so I will I will ask staff to do that, but a reminder uh, that delegations are not to be asking questions of staff. Uh, we do have the opportunity after we get through the delegations to uh, ask these questions of staff and have a dialogue then. Uh, respecting that uh, this has been raised a few times now, if, if staff are available to give a brief answer at this point, uh, respecting we will get back to this. I, I will allow that. So perhaps, oh, there's Valerie. Uh, Madam Chair, my colleague Jared Riley will address this issue. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The online property standards database, uh, which we're preparing, will be a great tool to allow uh, any, any tenant or prospective tenant to look up a history of violations at the building. Uh, so this provides better consumer awareness for the tenant. They can research and make a more informed decision before they decide to move into a property. Okay. Thank you very much, Jared, and I'm sure we'll have more on that uh, later. Uh, any other questions for the delegation? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you very much, Megan, again, for joining us. Uh, the next delegation I do not uh, see on the line, and that was Kristen Jubot Brinston, which I don't believe is on. Is that correct, uh, committee coordinator, Mark? Correct. Uh, she's not on at the present time. So we will go to the next, who is Jerry Stevens. Do we see Jerry Stevens on? He's on the phone. I just allowed him to talk now. So fantastic. Okay. Jerry, if you're there, you have five minutes. Okay. Jerry, if you uh, can hear us now, you have five minutes. There we go. Jerry, are you there? I'm sensing we Hello. don't. Do we have, I'm looking for Jerry Stevens. And I'm here. Okay, fantastic, Jerry. You have five minutes. Oh, you can hear me? We can, yes. Yay. <laughs> 
members of committee and city staff. So, yes, I'm Gary Stevens. I'm the current co-chair of the Central Ottawa chapter of ACORN. I'm formerly the co-chair of Toronto ACORN's East York chapter. And I apologize for the blank screen, but my Chromebook called in sick last night during a Central (laughs) Ottawa chapter meeting. Anyway, I'm hoping to talk to you about what it's like to live in a mismanaged apartment building. When I lived in Toronto, without realizing it, I moved into the most poorly managed building in Toronto. It's called 500 Dawes Road, D-A-W-E-S. You can look it up. It's, it, it was the worst. I, I had no idea that such buildings existed in a first world country. Um, but typical of such a privately owned, affordable building It was plagued by lax maintenance and repairs, cockroaches, bed bugs, ants, mice, black mold. To top it all off, it was inaccessible. So that living experience is what brought me to ACORN in 2011. I actively joined ACORN Toronto's campaign to establish landlord regulations, and that that fight defined my life for the next five years. The ACORN campaign to regulate landlords was already years in progress and would eventually last more than 11 years. In 2013, ACORN Toronto organized a deputation in front of City of Toronto's Executive Committee, which included Mayor Rob Ford and Deputy Mayor Norm Kelly, and I led that deputation. And as I spoke about the suffering that tenants endure in poorly managed buildings, I wondered if by the expressions on the faces of the councillors and the mayors, whether they were sympathetic to the deputations or not. And honestly, I didn't see that many sympathetic faces in those chambers. But surprisingly, the ACORN deputation brought Mayor Rob Ford to 500 Dawes Road, and he spent more than four hours there investigating the squalor of my building and I was there with him every minute of those four hours. And at some point he said to me, you know, in in 14 years of politics, Jerry, this is in like the top 10 worst buildings I've ever seen. So when I moved to Ottawa a few years later and started attending Ottawa ACORN meetings, the stories I heard from members of Ottawa ACORN were just so familiar to what I'd seen in Toronto, it astonished me. I'm in the capital city of Canada and bed bugs are biting toddlers. There are broken windows patched with cardboard, not enough heat in the winter, too much heat in the summer. People like, keeping their cockroaches in jars to prove to landlords that they existed so that they could be eligible for pest extermination. I used to keep my bed bugs in a plastic baggie in the freezer. And then there's the case, and I've heard of this in Ottawa and also happened in Toronto, where elevators break down consistently or even occasionally, and that can result in seniors and disabled people being stranded in their units because they can't access, they can't climb down even maybe three flights of stairs or 14 flights of stairs, depending on the size of their building. Anyway, the list goes on. So today, I want to see many sympathetic faces within Ottawa City Council. So let's not pull a Toronto and turn the fight for pest control and rental management into an agonizing long affair. By passing these two important bylaws and implementing them as soon as possible, not the end of next year, you can help stop tenant suffering today, please, and thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. I I appreciate uh, you sharing those um, experiences, and um, I I think you do have a sympathetic uh, committee here that uh, that is working on your behalf, so I appreciate you you joining us. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's any hands up. And I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you again for joining us, Jerry. You're welcome. 
And next we have, uh, oh, I just see a message. Next uh, delegation has uh, taken herself off the list. So next we have John Dickey. And John, are you with us? Yes, I see John. And there we are. So John, once you get yourself off mute, you have five minutes. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Sutz, I appreciate that. Um, so let me start by saying that I am sympathetic and EOLO members are sympathetic to some of the uh, trials that ACORN members have reported here today. But despite our sympathy, we need to address the facts here and the facts which have been found by both city staff and implicitly by the committee and council previously are that the vast majority of rental properties are well maintained and the vast majority of landlords have procedures and do address maintenance um, issues properly and promptly. So what is important here is to thread the needle. If uh, too many requirements are imposed, bearing in mind that they're not needed for 90 or 95 or 98 percent of landlords, that raises um, the work that has to be done and it can raise the costs and that can put up the cost of rental housing and the city does not want that. On the other hand, on the other side of the needle, there needs to be enough teeth there to ensure that the people, the, the, the bad apple landlords, I'll call them, who are not doing what they need to do, do what they need to do in greater numbers. It'll never be 10,000 out of 10,000 people, but let's raise it from 9,500 people to 9,800 people, and we've done made an improvement. So from that point of view, the bylaw provides minimum standards to try to raise those people, the standard of service of those a few landlords who are not currently delivering good service. And EOLO supports the staff report. Uh, we also support the changes uh, that have been proposed by councillors Liloff and El Shantiri. Um, the change by Councillor Lulov, I believe, was triggered by an ACORN request. And from EOLO's perspective, we are satisfied to support that change so that there will be more documentation for tenants who want to take it, let's say, to the landlord and tenant board, or perhaps even discuss it with a, a, a bylaw enforcement officer. That, in fact, might, to a point almost, Minim or reduce the need for the city staff to investigate the issuance of some kind of a report from bylaw. Not sure about that. That's just a thought I've had on seeing this, uh, this uh, change. The changes from Councillor El Shantiri uh, are important changes. Uh, the, the one with respect to the pest control posting, I think was just an oversight initially, and it's good that's cleaned up the changes to allow additional means of delivery of these documents are important because um, if you can remember, um, there was concern even of a fee of $20 per unit that the impact that would have on um, the affordability of housing at the margin. And a registered mail uh, cost is $9.50 plus the postage. So, and couriers are similar cost, $10, $11. So you can imagine that landlords would be unhappy um, in the case of a 200 unit building, they may have to send out 50 of these packages to tenants who will not sign. That would done the old way would have been a $500 expense and that might come up every year. So done the one, new one minute, it may be a couple of hundred dollars but it won't be $500. So we appreciate those changes. Um, in conclusion, let me uh, commend the staff for their careful consideration of the issues brought forward by all sides. Let me also 
uh, speak in support of the new pest control provisions, which will assist a great deal in having both landlords and tenants do their parts to eliminate pests, and that is what is essential. Uh, also, let me say I look forward to working with them on the rollout of the, the new templates and the information, uh, as well as the public registry and the potential report, uh, which, uh, I, uh, which was mentioned before. Um, so I think that's it, um, with the exception that I do want to say that Paramount is a member of Yolo, and Paramount has a good reputation for pest management. And I can only think that these cockroaches in the unit complained of are coming into the unit from a neighboring unit and that work needs to be done there. And it may well be that these new pest control um, changes will indeed uh, assist in the resolution of that problem. Uh, so no one should need to live with cockroaches and bed bugs, but everybody needs to work to stop that from happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, not seeing any hands raised. Oh, no, you oh, have yes, four I, hands. You have four. I am now, yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden it lit up. All right, so I will start uh, with Councillor El Shantiri. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dickey, for uh, not just for your presentation today, but also for your involvement. Uh, and I was going to ask you about the, the, the two motions my colleague Lulav and myself introduced, but it seemed you touch on it, you're, you're, you're in support of those motions. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, both of them. All right, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dickey. Excellent, uh, and now I'll go to Councillor Eglai. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, just uh, taking myself off a of mute there. Uh, John, a couple of quick questions about your organization. Um, what percentage of landlords in the city does your organization represent? Um, of the made of the multiple unit stock, uh, our members represent uh, man own and manage forty thousand out of the sixty five thousand um, multi residential units in the city. So that's so, so two thirds of the purpose built stock. We also have some members who run smaller units and I am in touch with the two organizations which are um, predominantly smaller owners. Um, and certainly their concerns are a little different from ours in some respects, but the overarching concern that it is essential to thread this needle um, applies to every landlord in the city. Do, do you have any kind of internal, for lack of a term, policing system? Do you have a way to root out bad apples within your organization? Um, now that's a very interesting question, which we have given some consideration to. What I would say primarily is that we do not uh, beat the bushes trying to have bad apple landlords join our organization. And frankly, they do not typically want to join our organization because we are willing to call it like we see it. We are willing to say that certain things need to be done. Uh, there will be small landlords and even a few mid-sized landlords out there who are probably appalled that I'm not uh, fighting tooth and nail to stop this bylaw from going through. But we think it's a reasonable balanced compromise. Um, and we think it is um, a worthwhile endeavor from that point of view. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Well, it, partly. Um... Follow up, do you have any internal processes that can remove a landlord if they're a consistent um, uh, bad behavior or, or a certain number of complaints filed? Uh, do you even know that that's happening within your membership? We certainly could remove a member. Uh, we have not needed to. Uh, the bad apple landlords don't tend to join in the first place. Um, I will say that we have one or two members who um, are constantly being vilified in the press, but when we look at their records of what they've done, when we talk to them, our understanding is that they are dealing with uh, particularly difficult situations. 
Um, and uh, to take the pest control example for one, um, this is a different landlord I'm thinking of than the one who was named, but um, pest control has been difficult because the tenants have to do the preparation. The tenants have to keep units clean to keep cockroaches gone. And we could enforce those requirements by notices of termination or applications to the landlord and tenant board, but it was a long process and um, unhelpful in getting problems solved quickly. So what this new bylaw will do is it will enable us to point to the requirement under the bylaw to report, that wasn't even a, a bylaw requirement, to cooperate, to uh, take the steps, follow pest treatment protocols, and to avoid conditions in low harbor units. So with those three requirements on tenants, with the help we, we hope in hard cases of the bylaw enforcement officers, we should be able to get more tenant compliance, which should be able to have better pest control. That's those I think are the biggest things that we like in this bylaw and recognizing that there are uh, requirements being imposed on landlords for IPM um, and other things as well. Uh, we, and we're fine with that as a balance. Some of our members use IPM, others more respond uh, to treatment and many of our members do not have any significant pest problems in their buildings at all. So, so John, I'm, I'm just going to say I'm not a huge fan of the blaming the victim ideology, and that seems to be where you're veering, saying that the, the tenants are not preparing their apartments properly, the tenants are not following the rules, the tenants are not cleaning. Um, do you have specific guidelines for your, for your members, for example, that says if you have an infestation in one unit that, that the whole building should be done or the whole floor should be done so they don't simply move from one unit to another? Well, it's not a question of the whole building or the whole floor. It's been standard practice for decades that typically uh, when there is a, any significant infestation, the nine units around the unit in question, the unit will be inspected to find the focal unit. Now it may be the focal unit is one beside or, or above. So that's why you do the nine, you do the besides, you do the belows and then you do the corners. First you inspect to make sure you've got the focal unit. Once you find the focal unit, then you do the nine units around the focal unit. So that might end up being 12 units instead of, instead of nine units. Do we have guidelines on this? Um, a number of years ago when, when bed bugs were sort of come into force as a problem, um, we did education for our members. We consulted with the pest control people. We organized a lot of public information uh, and we also worked with the city and OPH. And so we, we put out protocols for our members, but our members the, don't really need those protocols. They were following these practices in the first place. We assembled their best practices. And to let me deal with the blame game, it, it, a tenant is not blameworthy if they you know, accidentally bring in pests from uh, the public library or going to their doctor or what have you. However, I would say that tenants are blameworthy if they bring in used furniture, which is a common source of infestations, or if they don't, do not keep their units clean. And that is a minority, but it's the minority that causes much of the problems that, that affects good landlords and bad landlords and good tenants and bad tenants. And so that's the only degree to which I, I want blame uh, assigned where it's deserved. And I agree also, if a landlord does not act properly, they are blameworthy. Well, I'm just gonna say, I don't think blame's gonna solve this problem. I think working collectively is gonna solve this problem. And I'll just turn the, turn the mic over to somebody else. Thank you, uh, Councillor Aglai. And, and I, uh, I can't help but but comment, uh, I, I really don't think the Ottawa Public Library is the source of our problems when it comes to pests. So uh, if we can refrain ourselves from making these types of assumptions, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's warranted. So uh, moving on, uh, I think uh, Councillor Fleury has a question. I do, Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, John, good to see you. We'll be uh, meeting with uh, the university shortly. So uh, 
you you and I are often in touch and uh, I have to say that although you represent the large landlords you have been uh, involved with some of the most challenging uh, bunkhouse situations in, in my area for, for a number of years. And, and I think uh, that has helped um, tenants in the community uh, and, and landlords to uh, uh, upheld uh, and put in place standards. I have three key questions. Um, some of the elements that were raised were around uh, cleanliness and readiness of the units. What do you think is needed uh, to ensure that a landlord commits that the unit is ready and, but will I'll, I'll use quote unquote bug free um, coming into the unit. What does it take? What do we need to do in our regulations to ensure that that's in place? Because it's assumed, but how do we guarantee it? Well, I'm thinking out loud here, but in the first place, in my experience, it's not a very common situation. Um, it is already an obligation that the landlord has under the Residential Tenancies Act to deliver a unit in a good state of repair. And that would mean free of pests that they know of. Um, I can think of situations where a tenant is desperate to move into a unit and the landlord has a unit um, I think a responsible landlord would give the tenant a choice, pointing out that the unit still needs treatment if, they, in fact, the landlord knows of the problem. Um, in some cases, I suspect this happens because the landlord does not know of the problem. And some pests, especially bed bugs, are, it is difficult to identify a low-level or mid-level infestation if there is not a tenant in the unit. So the tenant who moved out had an infestation. Well, they may not even have known, often they don't, but they can know from the bites or from blood uh, spots on, on the mattress and that kind of thing. But an empty unit, um, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the easiest thing to walk into and in a day or two or a couple of hours or an hour, identify if there are bed bugs in that unit. So. Um, I think that perhaps is a problem that should be uh, put off to the review of this bylaw, which I understand is to take place in three years, to see if in dealing with what we already have, in dealing with IPM, in establishing where those things go, uh, that we can do better on that, um, that, that readiness problem. Would you be opposed to uh, including in the documents that are provided uh, at signing an affidavit from the landlord or the representative of the landlord uh, speaking to the readiness of that unit? Uh, yes, I don't think that's um, a, a good step forward in terms of uh, encouraging landlords to uh, rent units, encouraging landlords to make them available. Um, some people speak against back-to-back -back moves, but if, if, you, if there aren't back-to-back -back moves, if you know, there has to be 15 or that days between tenancies that could turn into 30, you, you're just about chopping the rental supply by 124th or 112th um, in um, avoiding back-to-back -back moves. I, you know, I, I think these are things that um, the, uh, the tenant should, it's perfectly fair for the tenant to ask, and uh, I think if the, the landlord would, would be responsible, um, if they knew there were a problem to, to say that there's a problem here and we're on it. Um, I have a different question. It's very common. In the list of provided documents, we keep talking about paper copies and hand deliver and so on. I, I happen to be the type of generation that reads less the paper copy than the email copy. Um, I, I want to understand from a legal point of view, because that's your background is legal uh, and you're there to advise the, the landlord and, and you, know, you, you play an advocacy role uh, there with, with all levels of government. Wondering what is the limitation to transform all this to an online, uh, online element? So we talk about an online database. We, why can't we just force everything online in existing regulations or in these measures? 
Uh, one of the problem is that some of the older, well, again, let me not um, stereotype people, but there are some landlords who aren't very adept with the electronic stuff. Uh, there are a few landlords who didn't even have emails, although the ones I know, their children certainly do. Um, so one of the issues was uh, the requirement that the um, a landlord provide the tenant an e um, an ability to notify by electronic means. We actually opposed that. Uh, the staff insisted that everyone who's renting a unit should have an, an e means. So that's fine. Um, but I think there would be a certain degree of difficulty and resistance among older landlords. Oh, sorry, there I said it again. But among landlords who are less electronically adept. Um, you said the new generation, Matthew, I'm going to blame it on you. You're the one who started this new generation, old generation thing. I'm just following along. Um, so I think that's the issue. And as compared with many businesses, there are more land, more a higher percentage of landlords are the older generation rather than the per percentage of say restaurateurs or, or, or other, other businesses that you could name. So again, I'm not, um, I think, uh, the large YOLO members would have no problem with, with going electronic, but uh, this, the, the, and, and the, frankly, the staff have wanted paper copies as far as we can provide them. Um, they think it's a good thing for tenants to have a document. Uh, one of our arguments was that, well, they'll put it in a drawer and they'll never read it again. Uh, what about posting? But that was rejected. So, I mean, I think it's the same kind of thing that there is there is, any, is there just a short answer there? Uh, being cognizant of people's time, can is there a legal limitation to forcing uh, online communication or email communication? Uh, there can be uh, certainly to forcing it as the only communication. I, I mean, the, the, as you know, the laws tends to be slow, and so there isn't yet an assumption that everyone has e-communication that everyone can readily access uh, the web. I mean, as a practical matter, more and more and more people can. Just for those who aren't privy to why I'm asking that, John and I have been uh, made aware over the years of, of complex legal issues when a landlord or a tenant informs uh, one another and the peer that it's acceptable and, and the paper copy is deemed to be received over a three day window. An email takes a second to send and has a, a footprint. So I, you know, just so that people have context, uh, I'm, I'm, I've taken a firm position now that we need to fully upgrade, but I'll, I'll bring that to staff after. My last question, Madam Chair, is uh, to the delegation is about, you talked about pest management, and I'm curious, uh, John, what is your, what should be the trigger to force uh, treatment to neighboring units? Because right now, we rely on reporting, and we rely on what you've described as standard from the industry. But there's nothing in regulation that says, unless the person reports, then you could have a full infested floor, but just one complainant that you keep treating, but you're not getting to the focal unit, you're not getting to the source. So can you, what should we put in our laws or what's the threshold that should trigger uh, a, a full floor uh, scan? Well, I think the requirement to have an integrated pest management plan will in effect require that because part of IPM is prevention and that there's there's entirely proactive prevention, but then there's the checking neighboring units. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I'd call it an IPM plan if it doesn't include that. So I think that's already in the bylaw. It's just not spelled out specifically. Okay. I mean, I have to be able to, to comment on that, but that's my understanding of IPM and certainly what I'll be telling people and informing people of in terms of helping to roll out the information about this bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. And I see one last hand, which is Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dickey, for your presentation and those before you. Can you describe for the committee what annual inspections or annual maintenance work on average landlords do in a tenant's unit. 
Um, they inspect the smoke detector. Do they inspect the carbon uh, dioxide machine? Do they check the heater? Is there is there a checklist on average that a landlord does on an annual basis? Um, I'm not 100% certain. Um, th I, there is not across the industry a standard list, but I suspect that each owner would have their own checklist and it may be on paper or it may even be electronic. The move is to go to handhelds. And the inspection would be, as you said, the fire safety systems. Uh, the inspection would be to make sure there's no evidence of water penetration from the outside, no evidence of leaks in the plumbing. Um, if there were evidence of uh, sparking on the electrical plugs, that would be, I think, observed and, and noted and then investigated. Um, the working of the appliances, um, I think we would tend to leave the tenant to report that there is an element isn't working, or certainly we'd certainly expect the report if the whole stove isn't working, I mean, the oven. Um, and, and I mean, we get those calls and we attend to them. Um, the other thing is that it, the practice varies, but some landlords, the, the cutting edge landlords already do IPM and already do check for all signs of uh, cockroaches. And insofar as they can, they may check for, for bed bugs. I, I think they do because uh, one of them talked to me about the number of units that they find in, in an ordinary building that have uh, pests, which they then go and deal with proactively, having done the inspection and having found the problem, even though the tenant in most or all cases in, in that situation has not reported it. I asked that question in the context of the pest control. You know, my maternal side all live in Florida. Spraying in a tenant's unit or even the, my family's homes is an annual basis. You proactively spray because you don't want your home to be overrun with pests, with, with bugs. And if I'm a landlord in a reputable building and I wanna maintain my building and the reputation of my building, I'm gonna spray. I'm not gonna wait for one tenant to report because I think it's very unlikely that if a unit has pests that it's contained within that one unit. I just, knowing all the work that my office does with with other tenants who have bug problems, it, it's, it's spread throughout the floor, if not multiple floors. So I don't understand why spraying isn't done annually proactively by landlords because it's in everyone's best interest. Yes, there's an expense, but the hassle, the amount of administration time, dealing with service requests um, for a problem that just keeps shuffling around a building, I, I just, I've never been able to wrap my head around, other than cost, why a landlord would not do that. Uh, well, I think I have some answers. Why sure. uh, Health Canada does not want us to spray unless we need to, among other things, because then the bugs get more resistant to the sprays and that makes them less effective, which makes the problem worse in the long run. The second thing is, in, and indeed included in IPM, is that you don't spray unless you've identified what the pest is and what is the best way to treat it. In some cases, you don't even need to spray. What you need is a vacuum cleaner. What you need is something else rather than spraying. So also in Canada, because we only have one hot season rather than in Florida, it seems to me they have three hot seasons and one of them is excruciatingly hot. Uh, bugs tend to be a bigger problem in Florida than they are here. Um, a third reason for not doing it is that the tenants need to do a certain amount of preparation and that's a nuisance on the, on, to the tenants. In fact, some of the tenants are reluctant to do it even though the, the bugs are actually there um, because it, it can be a nuisance. Uh, and depending on the time and the situation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, landlords would, want for, for the sake of their tenants, would very much oppose any requirement that we, we spray for even bed bugs every year. What is needed in IPM is to find the problems more quickly. Uh, I, I'm, I, it, 
I'm, I'm surprised that there are many landlords. If you're telling me there are landlords out there who don't check the nine units around, or at least the four up and down and beside um, of, of a problem, um, it surprises me because that's certainly not our experience and certainly not the practice of people, ELO members. Uh, there was a last thing which almost, oh yes, the thing I do know landlords do that the common practice is, is to spray <clears throat> in the common hallways in an effort to stop spread between units. So again, that means there's less, there's no requirement for unit preparation. So that, that is, it's common practice to do that on a, on a proactive basis. So, I mean, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I appreciate that. And so the other, you know, every side or every issue has two sides and I appreciate that. I, I do like the staff recommendation. I do think it takes us uh, in the right direction. I'm not convinced we're gonna solve the pest issue. And that's why I wanted to get your perspective. My last question is just about implementation. The staff's recommending up to a year or a year. Can your members implement before that time period? Um, we could, but there is a desire, I think, for the implementation time to be consistent across the city. Um, there certainly is work that needs to be done on these templates um, to, to help people do this right and to get it out. Because remember, I mean, my members could go in a matter of months, but my members are not the problem. Um, the problem is that 200 odd out of 10,000 bad apple landlords um, and they, one, the word needs to get out to them. It may as a result of media about this. Uh, two, the templates need to be there. It's, it's a little help to tell someone they have to follow these rules. And then they said, well, what, what, what form do I use? The city, to their credit, very much going forward with, with templates. Um, and I want to work with them. I mean, I'm offering my expertise to help get good templates. The, the structure will be determined by the bylaw, but there's ways to phrase things, ways to put things. There's the issues because there are different types of units and the information is to be quite unit specific. So, I mean, and, and then we get to the problem of, you know, that also staff time in terms of, I believe some of the team is now turning to the uh, short-term rental issues in Q4 of 2020. So we're pushed into Q1 of 2021 and then we go on from there. Okay, I, I appreciate that as well. You know, Madam Chair, I'm a little uncomfortable with the amount of time we have to wait to implement. I know staff has identified the rationale, but I'll yield to the committee to discuss and debate that further. But thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Uh, not seeing any more questions. Uh, thank you very much, John, for joining us. Uh, appreciate uh, your uh, willingness to work uh, with us and others uh, along the way. So thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back in the list. Uh, there were two individuals uh, that we called previously that uh, weren't on the line, but now are. So I'm going to circle back to Norma Jean Quibel. If Norma is on the line. Hello. I'm here. Excellent. I just unmuted myself. Fantastic. Good morning, counselors and staff. Um, my name is Norma Jean Quibel, and I am the elected co-chair of Ottawa West Nepean uh, chapter of Ottawa Acorn. Um, as you all know, Acorn is a local and national community organization of low to moderate income people fighting for social justice. In Ottawa, we have 32,000 members. And prior to COVID-19, our small team of staff would knock on doors four days, uh, four hours a day, five days a week, and talk to people about their issues. In the, four, in the past 14 years, we have always consistently seen uh, the cleanliness and maintenance of housing being the top issue that people who we speak to in these communities bring up. Now, while we are disappointed that council uh, decision on not supporting our pilot project on landlord registration, 
we are happy that many of those elements have been implemented through these bylaws and it will strengthen the protection for tenants. In particular, we are excited to see included requirements for capital maintenance plans and progress to review the follow up with tenant services requests. Integral pest may, integra, in, oh, I'm sorry, integrating pest management plans, a special um, asset registration instructions for tenants with information on their rights is also something we're happy to see. And strict timelines to respond to tenants' requests. ACORN has been calling for many of these changes for a long time. So we are thankful that the city has incorporated this feedback. Right now with COVID, a lot of people are forced to stay home. And we have noticed that a lot of worry that our members have um, has to do with anything that compromises their health, particularly bed bugs, because of the fact that they do bite and hence they can cause serious health issues that affect people's immune system. This puts people more at risk of catching COVID-19 and this is a huge threat. We know that COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting low-income people. And we know that these issues of bed bugs and pests, cockroaches and so on, also disproportionately affect low-income people. So we are worried about this health risk and the fact that things are going to hopefully get better because Ottawa has done a lot of work with uh, flattening the curve, but we are worried that a second wave could make these problems become more evident again. Um, so, uh, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, so, uh, all this to say that we can can't wait for the timeline that has been proposed. We are worried that the health of our membership will be affected. Uh, we are hoping to um, get a shorter timeline than spring 2021. We are hoping that staff can work in ways to find um, shorter uh, shortcuts to help reduce the time of the timeline. We propose that using templates that have been implemented in Toronto for pest control and other issues might help with shortening that timeline. One minute. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, we also would like to see some other quick changes to the, the bylaws just to make them more, uh, to strengthen them for our members and all disenfranchised and low income people around the city. Uh, one of them would be making sure that the response time for urgent matters in, involving in, infestation are within 24 hours. Um, not necessarily a visit to a unit, but the process being started within that 24 hours for pests because bed bugs and so on can be such a large and problematic thing. We would also like to see notifications of disruption of services put in uh, apartment units on notice boards. Time is up. Would also want, okay. Thank you, Norma Jean. I certainly appreciate your comments. Uh, just looking for questions. And I believe uh, Councillor Kavanaugh has her hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Norma Jean, for coming out today. Uh, 
I know you've done a lot of work on this uh, throughout the process and uh, much of the work of Edcorn has, has been incorporated into this, into these bylaws. And I know you didn't get 100%, but uh, I think it's definitely in the right direction. And I think you can agree with that. Um, my question is, um, is, is in terms of, um, uh, is getting the message out. Um, Edcorn has done a great job in organizing people and, and talking to tenants. And um, probably the biggest thing I find about this whole thing is that we're talking about giving people dignity that just felt like they didn't have a voice. And I, and I really appreciate that that's very, very important um, part of this. Uh, in terms of um, spreading the word, and it's, it's regretful that it's gonna take a full year to put in place. I'm trusting the staff that that's necessary. And if there's anything they can do to move that up um, or just make sure that things are monitored in the meantime, I think that's really, really important because I understand the frustration of, of the wait. It, it's, it is crucial, especially with the COVID-19 situation. But um, my question is about the education and communications um, and how we get that out. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts or suggestions on that? Um, should we be working, for example, with um, um, our, our public health partners as well to, um, to educate tenants on, on, um, on uh, what they can ask for if they, because they are, a lot of these things are about health concerns. Yes, I believe bringing in uh, public health partners would also help. I also believe that Mr. Dickey's organization with some help could also help there with some of it. I mean, we could um, work together on this education aspect. I think that that is a good initiative for everyone to work together on getting this education out there for everyone. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, these seems to be the key to this because we're talking about, uh, we tend to talk about the pest control and, um, and we're talking about um, things that if they're not repaired will uh, be problematic in, in, term, in the long term. So I, I thank you again um, for all the initiative you've done on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kavanaugh. Uh, and thank you, Norma Jean, for joining us. Uh, so next I'm going to go to uh, Christine Gibault brinston Christine is with us. Okay, so Christine Gibault brinston is next on the list. I think I see her there. We just got to get her off mute. All right. Are we able to get uh, Christine off mute? I've asked her to unmute, but it's up to her to do that. I can't okay. do it. All right, Christine, if you can see the, the microphone button, just uh, click to get yourself off mute. So it's usually the bottom left of your screen, Christine. The joys of technology. <laughs> oh, there we go. Excellent, you have five minutes, Christine. Oh. Oh, Christine, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you. I'm going to try, try and say a few words. Let's No, we're not hearing you, Christine. Okay, um, so uh, unfortunately, Christine, we're not able to hear you. Uh, maybe and connect with the um, committee coordinator to uh, get a call-in number, perhaps, Mark? Yeah, and Chair, we do have her speaking notes as well, so. Okay, very good. Which so have been distributed to everyone, so. Excellent, thanks for that reminder, Mark. Uh, speaking notes have been distributed, uh, but we can try a call-in as well. Uh, in the meantime, I, I will go to the next speaker, and then if Christine's able to connect, we'll come back to her afterwards. 
so next we have Edith Hamos. Edith is, yep, and I see Edith here yeah, and you're on here. Mute. Excellent, you have five minutes, Edith. Yeah, good morning, uh, city councilor and staff. My name is Edith Hamos. I am a senior and I have been renting at the CCO since Beaver Barracks since December 2010 in Ottawa. The reason why I wanted to speak with you today so is that you can understand the consequences for tenants when landlords are not held accountable for maintenance and repairs. Since January 2018, I was on em employment insurance sick leave and now I am on a pension. Before the employment insurance, I was working for almost the minimum wage. On January 25th, in January 25th, 2018, I was walking slowly in the alley, <clears throat> alleyway to my building. I slipped, fell, and hit my head on the stairs of another building that belongs to my landlord. I was already walking very carefully because the day before, I noticed that the snow had not been removed and the ice had not been properly sorted. From the accident, I received a concussion and I have problems ever since, such memory, balance, confusion, headaches, depression, etc. On February 26, 2018, Orkin came and checked for bed bugs. Their dog was jumping on my bed without my authorization. I found after they left a vial with a live bed bugs under my bed, of which I have pictures. Several times, Orkin has come to the building to check for cockroaches, and I asked the worker why they don't clean up the ventilation system. I did find that they are, the cockroaches are coming to the kitchen, uh, through the kitchen above the stove. He told me that they are doing only what are they, are they requested by the landlord. So now I have to put duct tape around the ventilation system uh, and uh, uh, and under the door, uh, 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 a padding to, to try to keep the cockroaches away. This is why it's important for tenants to be given copy of the pest control treatment beforehand. So we are aware of the steps that are going to be taken. And so we can communicate if changes need to be made. Another couple of years ago, we were told in the meeting that the geothermal system used to heat and cool our building was not properly built. And as a result, we received letters saying that we're paying extra money each month. Why we have to pay uh, extra for the cost of something that is not our fault? Yes, they do maintenance, but in a non-professional and irresponsible manner. And this has to be changed. If landlords were required to have capital maintenance plans like the bylaw suggests, they would have been on top of these problems from the beginning and the cost wouldn't have been passed down onto tenants like me. We are paying sometimes over six, $70, $70 after the $70 rebate. The heating and cooling does not work properly. It's too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, the windows are almost impossible to open. You can you the windows are impossible to open. You can get them open just a tiny bit. In the winter, I live in constant fear that I have a, because I have a small heater and it's freezing cold and do not uh, put on fire my apartment. With this ventilation system, I don't know how safe it is with the COVID-19 virus, because again, the windows are almost impossible. The only way to get air is to turn on the uh, air central, the, the central air conditioner. I agree with ACORN that other elements of this bylaw that I think are important, requiring landlords to have a process for receiving following up service requests from tenants, information for tenants, which should include snow Wait removal. Minute. Yes. Creating timelines for addressing service requests based on severity. 
thank you for your time and consideration. I urge you to please pass the new bylaw on rental housing property management. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Edith. Um, just looking for any questions, not seeing any hands up. So thank you very much, Edith, for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, is, did we, uh, were we able to get Christine Chibot back on the line? There is uh, someone that has called in with no name. Let me try and see if uh, okay. that might be Christine. Fantastic, thank you. Christine, is that you on the phone? Yes, you do. Can Fantastic. you hear me now? Excellent, we can hear you, Christine. Thank you, <laughs> thanks for persevering. Okay. So the floor Good is yours, morning. you have five minutes. Yeah. Sorry about our technical difficulties at this end. All good. Um, well, good morning to all our members of city councillors present. Uh, my name is Christine Gilbo, and I've been a resident of Timber Creek Community Housing for just over four years now. Uh, I live with my daughter, and we're both members of the Ottawa uh, South Acorn Group. In my working career, as I was a paratransport driver for for over 20 years. And now I'm a registered customer of Paratranspo in need of using a wheelchair for mobility um, because of the flesh eating disease. <laughs> and uh, so safety and accessibility is very much a concern of mine uh, for our housing needs and for better accommodations and reliability to safety standards for accessibility, ramps, accommodation, all of the above. And the province has made a mandate that Ontario be totally accessible by 2025, but I tell you from experience that we're a long way off. Um, even Timber Creek's offices are not wheelchair accessible. There is a big step to get in. Um, our buildings are not accessible. They don't have accessible operating doors, uh, ramps, that, or any the ramps that they do have do not meet the Ontario Building Code by any stretch of the imagination. Um, our locking system on our security doors don't work most of the time. Our buzzer systems are out of order very often. Um, even our contractors that do like Citron pest control, management just hands out the keys to our units and they just come walking in sometimes without notice and sometimes we get notices and they never show up. Uh, they've been pretty irresponsible for that matter. And I, the previous caller had mentioned about ventilation problems in the buildings. Yes, uh, my adopted daughter lives in Timber Creek's high rise uh, in the next street over, and she lives on the 15th floor and all her bathroom ventilation is blowing hot air inside to the to the bathrooms instead of drawing out the the stale orders out everything seems to be on a reverse system so that has been brought to my attention in the last month that there could be a real serious problem with that especially like the previous caller said the COVID-19 has really thrown many of us for a loop and we're still trying to deal with the problems as they show up. Um, let's see, besides accessibility, there have been other uh, issues in the building. Uh, when repairs have been done, they are not built, uh, repaired by the, our building codes. Uh, for example, example our uh, entrance doors, uh, the glass comes right to the floor, except for maybe two to three inches in a metal frame. And the glass 
uh, is breaking very easy in shard. And the Ontario Building Code requires that any glass that comes within approximately, I think it's 900 millimeters, or about 18 inches from the floor, has to be uh, tempered glass, laminated glass, or wired glass. And um, so if these um, changes to the bylaws for safety and accountability uh, that our, our, our le uh, landlords need to show more responsibility of, uh, would be much appreciated. Um, the pest control is definitely an issue and how it's handled, um, not sporadically. Um, they don't seem to take things seriously and they tend to uh, blame the tenant for the pest problems. Like we have cats and they say, well, you have your cat food dishes on the floor and the water dishes on the floor. Uh, where else are you going to put them? <laughs> anyway, I thank you very, very much for your time. And I hope as a group that we can uh, all get these problems uh, solved to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christine. I appreciate uh, you calling in and your time today. Uh, just looking to see if there are any questions and not seeing any hands raised. So thank you very much, Christine. Thank I you believe so to unmute it. To Terrific. Mute it. Uh, so you can hang up the call and then you'll be muted again. Thank you, Christine. Um, so next, uh, we have one last delegation, I believe, and that is Jean-Marc Ladisseur. And I see John there. Fantastic. John, floor is yours. You have five minutes. Uh, good morning, councillors, uh, Mr. Chair, or Madam Chair. I don't know how to say it. Uh, I live at 1244 Donald. I've been at 1244 Donald for about 10 years now. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit off script here because what the gentleman said uh, before uh, representing the landlord, I like the idea of the nine by nine, but some of the issues that I come up, up with, I had a stroke three years ago. I could lift, I could walk with a walker, but I can't lift and walk. Uh, my roommate is 71 years old. Uh, he's got mobility issues also. Uh, for to get an apartment like mine prepared, uh, Orkin wants us to move the furniture away. Uh, I think it's 10 inches or 12 inches away from the wall. They want us to pack everything in boxes from the kitchen. Uh, like in the kitchen, all the, uh, the kitchen cupboards got to be packed away. Your, your clothes got to be packed away. Obviously, I can't do it. My roommate can't do it. I got to hire somebody to do it every time. And it cost me $50 to do it, to get somebody to come in. Uh, then I found out I'm allergic to it. And that's one thing we did not cover in this bylaw. I break out in hives uh, really like badly when we got sprayed before. There is other options. There's heat treatment, uh, where the, you leave the apartment and they basically overheat your apartment and kill all the bugs, the bed bugs and the cockroaches. It works really well, uh, according to friends of mine that had it, uh, the system done. But it's for those that are us that are allergic to it, uh, we, there's got to be something in the bylaw that says that we are allowed to refuse the spraying for alternatives, but that's not covered in here at all. And I think that's very important to say. Uh, the buildings, um, few residential, they fired the cleaners. Uh, so the only floor that's getting cleaned, as far as I know right now, is the main lobby, because that's visible to everybody. The garbage chutes are not being cleaned regularly. Laundry room, we've got a uh, lack of uh, no ventilation. All the apartments around the laundry room are complaining about the heat. But the laundry, laundry the garbage chutes is an issue because the cockroaches go up and down. And if those are not maintained regularly, then it spreads, up, it spread, the bugs go from floor to floor to floor. Um, 
Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any vital points here. But for those, uh, for those like myself, I've got, like I said, I got mobility issues. A lot of people that live in these buildings, uh, we had, uh, we had a bunch of the people that came in from Syria, over a hundred units. And these people came here with nothing, nothing. Uh, we do have a uh, an area in the back of the building that people throw out furniture in, and that are sometimes bug infested. Well, unfortunately, some people didn't know any better. They bring back wood, like desks and stuff. Bed bugs live in desks or mattresses because they had nothing. So there's got to be a prevention also of from the tenant side, preventing the tenants from bringing this stuff back. One minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got to have a prevention in there, preventing people from bringing stuff back into the building. Uh, even the lock, there's a big area where you put the furniture, put a lock on it and have, uh, have maintenance, have the building staff unlock it, have the building staff clean the building properly, and also uh, alternatives. That's one thing I do want to specify. We need alternatives to spray for those that are allergic. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you very um, much. I'm just very passionate. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I believe uh, that's all of our speakers, although I know that uh, Councillor Fleury is chair of Ottawa Community Housing uh, had uh, a statement from OCH as well. So I'll give the floor to you, Councillor Fleury. Yes, Madam La Presidente. Uh, I did. This is a statement prepared by by the CEO. I want to uh, to preface by saying that Ottawa Community Housing is uh, Ottawa's largest landlord. Uh, we are not members of EOLO, uh, but uh, we are. Uh, we were engaged in, in the process and certainly uh, applaud the uh, the standardization and. Uh, clarity that the city has put in place. So the statement reads as follow, over the years and in partnership with its resident and agency partners, Ottawa Community Housing has adopted leading edge practices to monitor and control service levels and standards. We understand that this bylaw will help level the playing field amongst all landlords in Ottawa. We also understand that there will need to be a need for operational coordination with city services post implementation to mutually share data and information that will aim to service excellence. For example, calls received at 311 about OCH will need to be redirected to our call center as we have a 24 seven central line for maintenance and safety services. The calen le calendrier proposé pour les règlements est conforme à notre capacité opérationnelle de répondre aux changements proposés. Cependant, une période de transition sera probablement nécessaire pour certains, certaines nouvelles exigences spécifiques en matière de rapport. Finally, OCH is recognized as a leader and innovator in the housing sector. OCH is unique due to our size and relationship with the service manager, the city of Ottawa. The opportunity to participate in the development of rental housing property management bylaw was much appreciated. Together, we established mutual understanding of our desired outcomes, opportunities, and possible challenges to meet the rental housing property management bylaw. Ensemble, nous avons établi une, comp une compréhension mutuelle des résultats souhaités, des opportunités et des défis possibles pour respecter la réglementation de la Ville d'Ottawa concernant la gestion des biens locatifs et des usages ré résidentiels. And this is signed the CEO of Ottawa Community Housing, Stéphane Gier. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Councillor Fleury. Uh, so that marks the end of the delegations and I'll just confirm with the committee coordinator I'm correct. Yes, okay, perfect. I don't want to miss anyone. Um, so with that, I will move to questions of staff and I'll go again, I'll ask folks to just raise their hand and we'll go through uh, that way. So I see Councillor Fleury first to raise his hand. The floor is yours. 
Yes, Madam President, uh, I too want to echo uh, most of the speakers and, and your early intervention, applauding the work of uh, Valerie and, and Jared on, on the report. Uh, it is imp an important uh, fu foundational report for the city. Uh, in no means will it be perfect, but it will certainly set clear standards and objectives. So I want to preface my my uh, my questions to staff that I am fully in support of uh, what they're bringing forward and, and want to thank them for their work and engagement throughout. Um, I want to raise a couple of the, uh, the the questions that I raised to Mr. Dickey, beginning with the, uh, the communication. So communication between tenant and, um, and, and landlord, recognizing that there might be a, a, a need for some to still have paper copies, that the easiest way to track uh, interactions in my mind remains uh, through email. I wonder, it, although it is one of the categories, why don't we make that uh, the clear path? Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, okay. yeah, terrific. Yes, I can confirm for the um, councillor that with respect to the new tenant service request logs that will be, um, that, that we're recommending in this bylaw, we are requiring the landlords to ensure that as part of their um, procedure for managing tenant service requests, that they provide a means to receive written requests verbal requests and electronic requests from tenants who wish to make service requests. So we want those options to be communicated from the landlord to the tenant so that the tenant has options and the landlord has clarity on the channels through which they could receive a term, uh, tenant service request. We've, uh, thank you. We, we've seen in the past uh, issues where a, a landlord doesn't act and it takes a lot of times uh, through bylaw, for example, to, uh, to identify a contractor and go and do a work, let's say for uh, heating, cooling or mold issues. So tenant ends up moving out, but the issue remains in the unit. Uh, can, you, can you share with us uh, how this will be resolved? Like, how do we ensure that uh, elements that would be, I, would be outstanding in the public database as per an issue of a unit would, uh, would also influence um, the awareness of future tenants or uh, the limitations for a landlord to rent that unit. Um, Madam Chair, I would defer to uh, Director Chapman on the operational aspects of the councillor's questions, but uh, maybe I can preface um, the answer by saying that uh, the councillor's right, our searchable database that we're currently building and hope to have ready as soon as possible next spring will be tying in directly to um, service requests that are received by the city. That's why it's taking some time to build it. We want the systems to speak to each other. So once that is up and running, uh, we will be able to provide through that database and through searching through a municipal address, the history for property standards, property maintenance, this bylaw over time and uh, other bylaws so that a tenant will be able to see the history of um, service requests regarding things like heating or bed bugs or other issues. They'll be able to see the status of those requests, whether they're opened or closed. Um, and of course they can search it by, by address. In terms of actioning um, service requests, I think that is what the councillor's question was and how to resolve them over time, I would defer to Chief Chapman on that. Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, unfortunately, I had a minor glitch in my, in my screen here and uh, I didn't hear the entire question from Councillor Fleury. As I understand it, um, the question was regarding um, when tenants move out, uh, how do we follow up on those complaints, is that correct? Yeah, if a tenant were due to, um, to mold or, or heating or cooling, we know it's an outstanding issue, so there's an order, but it's not resolved. How do we ensure we don't put a future tenant in the same, um, the same issue? Okay, thanks, um, that, Madam Chair. So um, in those uh, cases, um, it, the, the challenge that we have is, is gaining entry uh, into the unit again to verify whether those deficiencies have been rectified. So 
Uh, in most cases, um, you know, depending on the on the deficiency. So when we're talking about mold or pest infestation, um, those type of things, we always try and follow up with the property manager to gain access. Um, that's not always possible, um, and in some cases, we've asked for verification from through ca uh, contractor receipts and such um, that would uh, provide evidence that the uh, the repairs have occurred. I think that's fair, but I wonder if Valerie, from a legal point of view, would have a comment. Like, what are what's our legal ability to, if we're if we're in the process of actioning a resolution? If I'm saying we, the city, then how come we don't we can't see it through? No matter if the tenant has changed, because we're made aware, and it it's a it's a it's an official step at that point when when bylaws involved. Madam Chair, I would defer to our legal services for any legal questions. Um, I could, I, I will say that one of the measures that we're proposing, the pest treatment plans might be helpful in this regard. Um, so bylaws will have the ability to request production of a pest treatment plan, uh, the integrated pest, the overall integrated pest management plan, and then specific pest treatment plans as well to see exactly what action was taken and when, which could assist uh, in the evolution of a particular case. Um, right of entry, as, as you know, Madam Chair, is very strictly regulated through legislation. Um, and so, as uh, Director Chapman has just said, um, bylaw staff do try to get right of entry through the property manager and understand that often that is successful. When there are problems that occur, they would have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that lawful right of entry can be obtained before any further inspections are done. However, I would defer to the legal services for any more comment on this issue. Yes, good morning, uh, Chair. Uh, just further to Ms. Beatlo's points, the uh, issue of entry into a dwelling unit is uh, highly regulated under the Municipal Act and the Building Code Act. Uh, in the case of the councillor's scenario, if the occupant is not uh, present or the consent of the occupant is not provided, uh, bylaw and regulatory services would work under the Municipal Act or the Building Code Act uh, to either get uh, entry to either verify what the repairs have been done or to carry out the remedial work if that's required, uh, normally pursuant to an order or a warrant uh, issued under the Municipal Act or through the court process. Okay. Um, one of the issues we've had in the past relates to availability of contractor. I've seen a number of instances where, you know, let's say a broken window. There's a broken window. Um, the, the tenant has tried to, as informed the landlord, the landlord is not taking quick action. So they call 311. Roger's team goes out um, and then they work uh, to identify a situation. The, la the landlord gets a letter from a random contractor saying it'll take them 30 days to fix it. And then right away they've bumped out a period. So I wonder what what as part of this effort corrects that particular issue of contractor uh, availability and, and, and response times. Well, Madam Chair, uh, regulating contractor availability is not something that um, I can see from a practical perspective can be addressed in a municipal bylaw. Um, the tools that we are proposing will put responsibility on the landlords to ensure that they have, first of all, capital maintenance plans in place for those big capital systems. Those plans have to provide inspections. Um, they have to account for uh, the condition of those systems, note any deficiencies, and note any plans for either repair or remediation. That's up to the landlord then to secure that repair or that remediation. Um, bylaws can request a copy of the plan on demand. It has to be produced immediately. Um, that will be a tool for bylaws to uh, use. And of course, the regulations that we're proposing today will work hand in hand with existing property standards and property maintenance issues. If the councillor is referring to the availability of um, bylaws to issue a work order and then to conclude the work themselves if the work order is not uh, met, 
then again, I would defer to Chief Chapman, but I understand that there are standing list of contractors that are available to the city to produce uh, that work and to make those repairs. The cost then can be tax rolled. That's specifically under the property standards bylaw. Um, Madam Chair, yes, that's correct. So um, contract availability is certainly a challenge in some cases, depending on you know, the deficiency list that's um, a part of the order that's issued. Um, things like a broken window, uh, when a new window has to be ordered, the reality is that uh, when it's an odd sized window and it's not um, readily available off the shelf, those windows have to be manufactured. So uh, there's often a 30 and even 60 day delay on, those, on the delivery of those windows. So uh, what we do is uh, we ensure that those windows have been ordered through um, uh, an invoice or a bill of sale. Um, so we ask the property owner to produce that so that we know at least that, that those are on order and we'll extend um, compliance deadlines based on, on those uh, documents that we receive. Okay, I'll take that away. But I, I do think that is an area of weakness in our overall is just, it feels like some landlords have taken advantage of, of just getting a contractor uh, delay notification to bylaw to not accelerate the work. My last question, Madam Chair, uh, relates to uh, pest management, and it relates to incidents where um, a tenant uh, would, uh, a neighbor of a tenant would uh, identify a focal unit for pest management. So I am tenant living in unit one. I report pest management. I continually uh, get treatment for my unit. I believe that unit two is the source of the issue yet they're not reporting. How will that, the database and the pest management uh, bylaw components address neighbors, um, um, the, 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 the IPM plan components? Thank you, Madam Chair. My colleague, Jared Riley will answer that, that question. Thank you, Chair. Um, the proposed Regulations can address that uh, through a number of ways. Uh, there uh, are charges that would be made available against a tenant who does not report an infestation or the conditions that charge an infestation. And the requirement for integrated pest management plans uh, includes a requirement for uh, regular proactive inspections of the buildings uh, and the effective treatment of pests. And that would include uh, um, checking the adjacent units, uh, depending on the, the built form of the building and the age and condition of the building. We need some flexibility for landlords to implement an effective approach. Uh, but that is the standard, is that it has to be kept free from pests and free from the conditions that would cause them. So in the event of an infestation, a landlord has to implement their integrated pest management plan and uh, would have to take the necessary measures to remove an infestation. And that would include inspecting other units around the building as uh, Mr. Dickey had uh, discussed. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Fleury. And uh, next I'll go to Councillor Eglai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So I have a, a number of, of questions. First, um, uh, we've we've used the term around this table a few times this morning, uh, bad apples, um, uh, and to refer to landlords that are not following the rules or or not uh, working with the city or with the tenants. Um, and while I appreciate that Mr. Dickey's organization represents a, a large number, and and um, it's his belief that that his, his members do not fall into that barrel of bad apples, if you will. Um, my question to, I, I guess it's to, uh, to uh, Roger Chapman is, um, Roger, we know that there are repeat offenders out there, if you will. We know that there are landlords who are not following the rules where um, your service is called out on an above average, um, number of times to respond to everything from heat not being on to elevators not working to infestations, you name it. Um, 
you you are a proactive sir uh, not a proactive service but generally speaking you're you're a service that responds to calls my concern around the new bylaw and, and i think there are a lot of good things in there and, and i appreciate the work the staff has put into it is that um some of these buildings some of these locations are going to sit with the problem continuing uh because for whatever reason uh tenants uh don't know to report, don't know how to report, or concerned about making a report because the impact it might have on their relationship with their landlord. Um, so I want this bylaw to have teeth. I, I want it to, to send a message to those. And, and I, I do agree, I think that it is the minority of landlords, but I want to know that you feel as the head of the service, it's going to be in effect the, uh, the boots on the ground, if you will that you feel that you have the tools that you need um, and the resources that you need to address these ongoing problem files, even if um, a tenant's not picking up the phone and saying, you know, this is the fifth time this year that the elevator isn't working. Like, is there gonna be a way for you to be on top of these things? And do you feel that you have enough um, resources to, to carry out that role, especially as we're unveiling this plan and we want it to be top of mind for both tenants and for landlords. Yeah. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, I, I think, you know, the biggest piece for us and what we see is um, um, a tool that we can use is the, the capital maintenance plan. And, and um, when I say that, I mean, you know, there's, there's a couple things here. First, I think you'll recall that back in November of last year, uh, Council approved um, to FTEs, temporary FTEs, um, to increase some of the, uh, I won't say proactive enforcement, but some focused enforcement at some of the problematic properties that we have. And I think, you know, um, Mr. Dickey spoke to those, you know, representing uh, many landlords in the city and our experience with the landlords in the city that, you know, I will say that most of the landlords uh, are pretty good to deal with and are very responsive to uh, complaints and concerns from their, from their tenants. Now, there are a few um, you know, as you said, uh, quote unquote, bad apples um, in, the, in, in the city that, um, you know, we regularly uh, return to those properties to have to deal with uh, ongoing issues. So I think, you know, with the addition of the two resources and, and doing focused enforcement uh, in the, on those properties um, and using the, the capital maintenance plan and uh, holding those property owners accountable to make sure that they have their plan in place and that they're doing those proactive inspections and we're hoping that that'll reduce the the call volume for those properties but in cases where they're not I mean um, you know we'll track those um, those complaints and we'll identify uh, the properties that, that we see a need to be proactive or focus some enforcement in, and uh, we'll continue to do that on an ongoing basis no and I appreciate that answer I'm cognizant of the fact that, that we're, we we can't really be telling you how to enforce or or but um, you know, I'm not confident that the people that are causing problems now are going to say, oh, we have put together a capital maintenance plan. We're going to go right ahead and do that. So I'm glad you, you've got an internal system of tracking um, that sort of landlord and that sort of circumstance and that you are, as you use the term, uh, will be doing focused enforcement to, to make sure the message is out there. So thank you very much for that, um, Chief Chapman. My second question, if this is the appropriate time, Chair, is I have a quick question of clarification around one of the motions. It would now. I believe you're on mute, uh, Chair. Love that I'm the first person who did that. Excellent. Uh, sorry, I just missed the end of your statement there. You might kind of want Yeah, so I have a quick question of clarification to staff about one of the motions that was tabled. Would this be an appropriate time to ask that question as well? Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. So I, I believe it's Councillor El Shantiri's motion, um, which talks about uh, giving notice uh, and of, of uh, changes uh, to the tenant. And I think it's paragraph 4G, if I, if I noted it down correctly, uh, talks about uh, providing proof of delivery in terms of uh, the use of email. Um, I have some concerns about the use of email, not the least of which um, uh, I think a lot of the people that 
most need this information don't necessarily have access to computers or, or to the internet to, to be able to receive it in that manner. But having said that, do, do we not really want to have proof of receipt? Like, I want to understand how this is going to work. Proof, proof of delivery could be, I, I show you that it's gone out of my sent file. And then I've, so in theory, I've delivered it, but it, it could have gone to a spam file. It, it, it could have gone to a, an old email address. So I, I, I think proof and or receipt or proof and receipt is, is, is more clear. But even saying that, are we going to require um, that the, uh, forget what the term is, but the, there's a button you can, you can hit to sort of say, I have received this, this email. So, uh, so are we gonna require that? Or are we simply gonna accept that the landlord shows here, um, here's, my, here's my sent file and it went to Matt Luloff on, on January the 5th, full stop. Because I don't think that means necessarily that Matt Luloff actually saw it. Um, so can I get some clarification as to how that piece is going to work? Or do we need to play with the wording a little bit? Madam Chair, first of all, um, I think what's intended here is proof of receipt. So I very much appreciate Councillor Eglai's comment. Uh, we would be, if Councillor El Shantiri is amenable, I would, staff would certainly support um, having uh, for subsection G of that motion change to proof of receipt um, to the, uh, by the tenant. So I'd be happy to put that as a friendly amendment if if uh, if I don't see Council Shantiri right now, uh, but I would certainly be happy to put that forward as a friendly uh, amendment so that there there is something coming from the individual who receives saying I got yeah. it. And Absolutely, staff would support that, Madam Chair. And then in terms of the second part of of the question about what would constitute proof of receipt, um, I understand that where this has been required in the past bylaws has required, as you say, um, that, that technical um, message through email saying that the message has been re received, which does require the receiver to turn on that function. That is the first way. The second type of proof of receipt would be an email back from the tenant saying, I received your email. Sure. So this would be one of several methods, um, as you can see from Councillor El Shantiri's email, but um, we'd certainly support that friendly amendment. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification. And, and, and EY, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes, I would, uh, Councillor uh, Igla. Yes, that, that would, okay. but I mean, just if you go through the whole list, there's more than one area we ask for receipt. But anyway, if we can add that to, uh, uh, to item four, subsection G, I have no problem with that. And Thanks also, that, Valerie, Valerie, we have you on. Councillor Fleury has asked if we clarify when we talk about commonplace to say uh, the lobby, uh, perhaps, versus just the common area. But we do say, if you notice it, plan in the lobby of the apartment building. When, when pre So he would like to emphasize on that area uh, with the motion. But I'm not sure if, how, how he would like to see the language, but he had asked. And I'm OK to add more to it to clarify what we mean is the apartment building lobby. That's when commonplace, not just for the tenant, but also for visitors as well. Okay. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. I'll take myself out of the discussion then, and if it wants to go on with, with Councillor Fleury. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Aglai. And I think we'll uh, come back to this. We, thank you, uh, Councillor Elshantiri, for raising that, and we can, uh, come back to that once we table the motion, but in the meantime, feel free to, to work amongst yourselves on it. Uh, I, I'll go back to the speakers list. Uh, and next we have uh, Councillor Luloff followed by Councillor Meehan. Madam Chair, uh, this time around, Councillor Meehan uh, was ahead of me. I came in last, so I will oh, allow, wow. allow her to go first. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you guys are keeping good track of this. I'm losing track. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Lula. What a, what a polite bunch we are. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, and thank you, and thank you, Chair. I, I just want to go back to uh, the point that I was raising earlier. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, um, uh, Roger Chapman uh, has a list of, uh, of uh, properties where there are ongoing issues that need to be addressed. 
And uh, we are aware that just a small percentage of the properties um, are responsible for the bulk of our, uh, our, our complaints, uh, our ongoing concerns with pests. And I'm just wondering, uh, I think this is the proper place for me to ask, do we have enough in our database in order to target properties that I think that we could speed up the implementation of uh, at least the pest control bylaws so that we um, address these issues uh, as you know faster for people who are really, um, and for lack of a better term, they are suffering. Uh, the fact that children are being bitten and living in these conditions is something that I just, I have a really rough time and I know a lot of us, most of us do, thinking about. Uh, if we can speed that up in any way, I'm just wondering if there's any possibility of doing that. Thank you. Madam Chair, my colleague Jared Riley will answer this question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will begin and then uh, invite uh, Chief Chapman if you would like to add anything in terms of uh, the city's plan to uh, implement these regulations. The one-year timeline was developed uh, in consultation uh, with Eastern Ontario landlords, Ottawa Community Housing, and my colleagues in community and social services. Um, as eager as people are to, to see these rules implemented, it's equally important that we set landlords up for success uh, and that we set our bylaw department up for success. So uh, we have certain dependencies within the city that need to be addressed. Uh, bylaws in the process of rolling out a new case management system. Uh, we would need to be able to integrate uh, all the provisions of these bylaws uh, and the new offenses and whatnot into that system. Uh, and set up the knowledge base articles, all of the service Ottawa materials so that we can actually process and administer the bylaw. Uh, so that work needs to be completed uh, internally uh, with uh, bylaw and regulatory services. Uh, additionally, uh, we have a lot of work to do to prepare all of the tools and templates and resources uh, that landlords and tenants will need uh, uh, to work under this new regulatory system. Uh, we also anticipate th that uh, work can be completed by the springtime. Uh, so that gives landlords several months to, uh, to prepare to implement. Uh, that's particularly important for the larger landlords who will have to prepare thousands of individual uh, instruction for tenants documents because these documents are specific to each tenancy in each unit. Uh, so it only provides them a couple of months to put together their capital maintenance plans in accordance with the templates and tools we've provided to prepare their in, uh, information for tenants documents and get those distributed and collect all of the signatures uh, that will be required to verify uh, that those have been issued and received by the tenant. Uh, so uh, we do appreciate uh, people are very eager to get these rules in place, uh, but in order to make sure that we're doing it appropriately and effectively, uh, we, we continue to maintain that a one-year timeline is appropriate. Uh, and I'll invite uh, uh, Director Chapman if he has anything to add to that. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, I think Jared's addressed the question, uh, you know, as far as, you know, in the next year, how we're going to address, we'll continue to do um, what we're doing now, and that's being responsive to those complaints about uh, pest infestation, and um, there are some challenges when dealing with that, and it's, um, you know, we're, we rely a lot on the, the contractors and the property managers to, um, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier in the discussion, I can't recall if it was um, Mr. Dickey who raised it, but in most cases, you know, depending on the infestation that's occurred and what the evidence that we see in the in the unit where we get the complaint, um, it's often necessary to um, to also treat units uh, up and down or below and under that unit as well as on both sides of the unit um, for milder or minor infestations that may not be necessary. And and again, if we don't see evidence of an infestation problem in those units, it's difficult for us to. Um, um, to issue an order to, to have those uh, units treated. But certainly as Jared's um, um, you know, spoken to, it's um, you know, the implementation of this um, pest control plan, um, I'm, I think um, will certainly lead to um, you know, a fewer, fewer problems or fewer infestation problems where we see where an entire floor is infested. Um, 
we're hoping that with through the proactive uh, work of the property managers and the requirements mm -hmm. to do this, it'll, it'll certainly uh, reduce those uh, concerns. So, uh, Roger, if I can just follow up on that, uh, what tool did you have? Uh, like, the were you able to um, issue um, uh, an infraction? Uh, what was that infraction? Is there a fine that's accompanied to it to a, to a landlord who has continually refused to address some of the pest issues? And I know that we're, we're implementing fines this time that's an, on an escalating scale. Um, do you think that's going to be enough in order to, to, um, to make sure that we are adequately addressing and probably solving these issues? Yes, so, Madam Chair, yes, I think, um, you know, the added tools will certainly uh, help us with enforcement. Um, you know, again, we're, we're still enforcing the property standards bylaw, but it, it is added uh, with the proactive work that the pro, the property managers, sorry, have to, uh, or property owners have to do. Um, I mean, you know, I can't imagine that we wouldn't see any reduction in, in those type of complaints or those types of infestation. But, but currently the, the mechanism that we have is we charge. So anything that we issue an order for, um, failing to comply with the order, we, we can charge for failing to comply with the order or we can hire a contractor to go in and do the work if the, if the landlord refuses to do that. Just to follow up, so for, the, for those properties that continue to be problematic, um, is there any way that even before this bylaw is, uh, we pass it and it's enacted, is there any way that you could possibly do that so that we can solve that issue now? Um, I'm just saying maybe the urgency, step up the urgency because we are in COVID, because uh, we are asking people to stay home longer. Um, is that a possibility? Well, I, I defer, defer back to Jared on that. I think he's given an explanation of the work that still needs okay. to be done to implement the um, um, the plan. So, um, I, you know, again, I refer back to, uh, to Jared on that. Okay. okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Mehan. And now I believe we're back to Councillor Luloff. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for putting up with our uh, incredibly annoying politeness uh, today. Um, two, uh, two points. Um, we've heard um, uh, several uh, of our witness, uh, witnesses are, of our um, interveners today uh, make comments uh, about the Ottawa Public Library. Uh, I want to set the record straight as the chair of the Ottawa Public Library uh, that we have uh, robust measures in place uh, to deal with issues like this. We do not uh, have an insect or a, a bed bug problem at the Ottawa Public Library. It remains a very safe place for, for everyone uh, to take out material and to bring material into their homes. Um, therefore, I just wanted to set the record straight on that, that the, uh, the Ottawa Public Library does have robo robust measures in place uh, and provides an incredible service uh, to our community. Um, so thank you to our staff that work incredibly hard there to uh, have opened uh, 22 of our 33 branches throughout this pandemic. We are providing incredible service across the city. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we could set the record straight on this. Uh, I do have a, a small direction uh, to staff here. Um, I'm the council liaison uh, for the Accessibility Advisory Committee and I've been chatting uh, with the chair uh, throughout uh, this meeting. This uh, report comes to us saying that there are uh, no uh, accessibility uh, considerations when uh, this report actually uh, creates a quote unquote special needs registry and mentions of accessibility requirements uh, in this proposal. Um, some of the language uh, regarding accessibility in this report is problematic from the AAC's perspective. Uh, and I would like to request um, that the AAC uh, be consulted uh, on this report. The chair uh, is willing to call a special meeting ahead of council, should that be the way that you wish to go. But I'd like to direct staff uh, to reach out to the Accessibility Advisory Committee chair uh, to make the proper arrangements to ensure that they are consulted on this report. Hey, thank you, Councillor Luloff. And if I can just ask Valerie to comment on that from a process perspective? Madam Chair, I'd like to confirm that we did consult with the city's corporate accessibility office on the measures that we were proposing. As you know, we are proposing, for example, that um, accessibility features in buildings form one of those key capital elements 
for which a landlord has to have a capital maintenance plan. Um, we're also proposing that problems with accessibility to the unit form one of those categories of urgent tenant service requests. And we had full support from the corporate accessibility office on those measures. Uh, in terms of the timing of bringing this report to the advisory committee, um, I, my concern there from a staff perspective would, that, uh, would be that it would delay um, the council's consideration of this matter. Um, if I could suggest what my team would very much welcome is that as we're preparing the resources for landlords, uh, educational material for tenants, our templates and samples, um, and all the other non-regulatory measures that we're bringing forward, um, we would uh, very much welcome bringing those issues to the advisory committee for their review and input uh, prior to launching them. I don't know if that would be um, satisfactory to the councillor, but that is something that we, we would welcome. As I said, my concern with having to bring this report to the accessibility committee prior to council's consideration of it is simply one of delay. Okay. Fair enough. I would appreciate an offline conversation between the policy team and the chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee prior to council to ensure that we can at least clear up some of the language that they find problematic when it comes to accessibility. Madam Chair, we can make that happen. Okay. Thank you very much. As usual, this policy group does incredible work. I know that thousands of hours of your time was poured into this. Very, very pleased with the results. Great job. This team is incredible and we're lucky to have you. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lulav. Uh, and I see one last hand and that's uh, Councillor McKenney. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs are barking just as I'm coming on. I have no control over them. Um, sorry, I'm not going to try to stop it. It's always okay. something. <laughs> yeah, it's always something. Uh, anyway, they're not there even watchdogs. They would let you walk in. They just bark at you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this. Very quickly, I've been listening to all the conversation. Um, many of the concerns that I had have been have been raised by my colleagues. Uh, I do want to echo what Councillor Luloff just said. Uh, this team uh, working on the full rental accommodation spectrum has done uh, an incredible job, uh, short term rental now long term, and uh, thank them for that. Uh, it's uh, I know it's a tremendous amount of work and. Uh, and uh, I think that what we have in front of us today is uh, certainly has met my expectations. I know that there's been a lot of consultation. There's always concerns, um, you know, moving forward. We wanna make sure that what we have in front of us and what we're moving forward with will make a real difference in people's lives. If you are renting from, uh, you know, a landlord who doesn't care about their property uh, and allows for infestation, it, it is life altering. So I want to recognize that. Um, and so, you know, from, from what I've heard, you know, in terms of, you know, moving out, people moving in, if we have a, a database with, you know, open and close, it's almost similar to what we have in the restaurant industry, you know, you can, you can find out, um, you know, if you're going into a place, um, what the, the history is and, and whether it's been taken care of. Um, the, 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 only, the only concern I'm left with, I think after all of this discussion is around the, the not just the immediate treatment of, of infestations. I understand that every infestation is, 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 is different, but how we, how we do ensure that there is a, a, a standard for really effective pest control. And that doesn't, from my understanding of the report, you're not saying, you know, you have to go out and get this type of uh, exterminator, but how do we ensure that before something is closed, we know that effective 
um, uh, management for pests has been has been uh, undertaken. That it's not just simply somebody came down and put you know double edge um, uh, tape on the floor, or, you know, grease on the the bedpost type of thing that that uh, really doesn't leave um, tenants with any uh, confidence that uh, that the issue has been uh, resolved. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Chair. Um, one of the requirements of integrated pest management and that we built into the bylaw uh, is a requirement to re-inspect following a treatment to ensure that it's been done effectively. Uh, and if not, then of course, an immediate retreatment would need to occur. Uh, that uh, window for re-inspections is based on the optimal time period for the life cycles of the most common insect pests in Ottawa. Uh, so that reinspection requirement uh, will help to ensure that the treatments have been done effectively. Uh, and the uh, new requirements for a landlord to provide a copy of the, their um, integrated pest management plan and specific treatment plans uh, will provide the documentary evidence to support uh, bylaw and regulatory services investigations in that regard to ensure that it's been done effectively. Okay, I mean, I certainly that, you know, that does go a long way. I mean, there's, there's that time frame when people are still living with, with pests and, you know, what happens if it's two or three times that you have to go in with, um, you know, with treatment, but uh, okay, I, uh, I understand that. And uh, I will, you know, circle back with conversations that I'm having with people if I have any other questions between now and, uh, and when this comes to council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and now I do see one more hand and that is uh, Councillor Cavanaugh. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, a, a lot of good questions have been asked. Um, um, I wanna add my voice to the thanks um, on the incredible work, uh, Valerie and Jared and the whole team. Um, they came and met with us ahead of time, uh, the councillors to talk about this. And, um, and I believe uh, many of our expectations were met. Um, what they're doing is bringing dignity to renters. And that is so, so important. Uh, we're going to see more and more renters, hopefully. Uh, we know there's a drastic shortage. And because there's a drastic shortage, um, it would be um, very tempting to rent places that are not standard because people are so desperate. So the fact that we are ensuring that they're standard um, is so, so important. Um, I just have a a question about um, about uh, the financing of these bylaws. Um, I understand that it's all it's self funded because um, we make it back in terms of the uh, the fines for the reinspection, et cetera, and that that's currently in place. Is that is that the case that we're already kind of rolling on in terms of the the new positions that are in place? Yes, Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So. Um, uh, but uh, we're still, um, we still have to go through the process for a year. How, um, how is it going on in terms of uh, completing the registry? Is that completed or is that part of what we're still working on? Uh, Ma Madam Chair, I'd appreciate a clarification um, about what the Councillor means about the registry. Um, well, the, 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 uh, the fact that we're now um, having uh, reporting going um, based on location <clears throat> rather than to the person. So um, this is a report about, uh, you know, 232 um, Jones Avenue rather than about uh, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so who are making complaints about a, um, in terms of uh, property. So that we, uh, is it already being built in in terms of the record keeping? Um, yes, Madam Chair, there's two measures. Um, the searchable database that will be by address and then um, the improvements to the internal systems for case management for property standards complaints that start with 311 and then lead to bylaw services and i can uh, i'd invite my colleague jared to again provide details on that if if the chair wants uh, thank you chair 
one of the big challenges we had when we began this study is the city did not have any processes to track rental housing. So in order to, to develop that picture, uh, you may recall that we actually had to, to uh, scan and manually process uh, thousands of records uh, so that we could get the picture for what rental housing looks like. Uh, and that was reflected in um, uh, the November report in the property standards and rental housing document uh, describes that work and, and uh, the methodologies that were used in detail and provides all of the findings. Uh, Moving forward, we want to be able to track rental housing uh, complaints from the instant they come in through Service Ottawa. So we will have, uh, over time, the ability to look at a push button uh, view of what's happening at rental housing in the city. We'll be able to provide council with some very detailed metrics uh, about how this new bylaw is performing and what additional rental housing units may need to be addressed. Uh, but we have none of this right now. Uh, it's all dependent upon uh, first council approval of our recommended regulations, and then setting up all those backroom processes to manage it. Uh, so that will take some time to do, but once that work has been completed going forward, we'll have a much better system for managing the quality of rental housing in the city. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of, of having this bylaws go through, um, it looks like we have good support around the table, but um, is there any issues in terms of presenting with the province since they are the ones that deal with uh, landlord and tenants? Um, they've recently had some legislation that wasn't very positive for tenants, um, uh, but uh, I just wanna make sure that we don't have any glitches there. Uh, do we anticipate any issues there? Madam Chair, uh, we are aware of the uh, recent legislative initiatives by the province. Um, we've looked at them and I can say that they have no, um, no relationship to what we are proposing to committee today. Uh, no impediments uh, and uh, they, they uh, do not interact with the regulations that we are proposing today. They are squarely within their jurisdiction of landlord and tenant relations. Okay, thank you. I, was, I, was, I just wanted to have that said out loud. Um, in terms of communications, um, I think the most important thing is to let tenants know uh, this is going to exist. Um, what kind of communications plan um, are you looking at? Madam Chair, I will um, invite my colleague Jared to provide details. He's on mute. Jared, you're on mute. Thank you. Right, that was my <laughs> turn. Of course, the, the biggest uh, communications tool that we have is the City of Ottawa website. Uh, and that will be beefed up with a lot of content uh, and tools to support uh, both tenants and landlords. Uh, we will also, on the tenant side, be producing that material in multiple languages, uh, including the languages that are most commonly spoken uh, by tenants in rent rental housing. So we've looked at demographic data for that. Uh, so there will be the electronic and social media channels. We're also aware that uh, not uh, all tenants have access to that information, uh, but we will be looking for other ways to engage them and working with the community partners and, and the really large group of stakeholders that we've been able to assemble through this project uh, and uh, rely on our community partners to also help us uh, spread that message. I appreciate that because uh, with community associations, they tend to be homeowners and we don't have as many, with the exception of ACORN who've done an excellent job of uh, organizing tenants. Um, I think we need to encourage more to, to get together so that we have audiences to present to as more and more because renters are going to be, there's going to be more and more of them in the future, I expect. Anyway, thank you again for all the work um, to the whole team. That's it. Excellent, thank you, Councillor Cavanaugh. Uh, I do not see any other hands. Uh, so with that, uh, we do have motions that uh, we 
tabled earlier to uh, vote on and then we'll vote on the um, report in entirety. So the first one would be uh, the motion by Councillor Luloff. And uh, will we put that back up on the screen as we, uh, as we call the vote? So this is with respect to the record of tenant service requests. Uh, were there, and I apologize, were there any further questions about this before we move forward? And just open my, not seeing any in hands raised. Okay, so on the motion, carried. 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 Fantastic. Thank and you. then the second motion was uh, the motion by uh, Councillor El Shantiri. And if we can put that up on the screen, I believe there was the friendly amendment as well on this on section 4G uh, to read email for other electronic transmission with proof of receipt to the tenant. Any questions on that before we move forward? Okay, is it carried? Carried. Carried. Comes up on the screen. Carried. Thank you. Were there any other motions uh, on this before we vote oh, on the sorry, report? Yeah, Madam Chair, I thought the amendment was carried. Uh, if we could just get staff to comment on the point that I raised to uh, Councillor uh, El Shantiri, just for the record. Sure. Very good. And would you like to elaborate so everyone is aware? Yeah, if, if we could have it back on the screen, uh, Mark. I was proposing a friendly amendment as it related to the front lobby as Councillor Alshantiri was raising, but staff raised that, that that might bring additional ambiguity. So just for the record, uh, 30 point, 30, 32 point, the last four words there, other than a rental unit, just to clarify the, the meaning of that uh, for the record, uh, Valerie. Um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, the, this section, is specifically addressed to create an obligation for landlords to post public notice in the building of a treatment for the public areas of the building. We know that when a landlord plans to treat a rental unit, they have to give a copy of the pest treatment plan to the tenant. This is not what this particular section addresses. It, uh, as I say, it requires a landlord to post a notice of the plan um, in an apartment building when treatment is being contemplated for those public areas of the building other than a rental unit. Thank you. So um, the Councillor El Shantiri's motion to add the words accessible to tenants is actually very helpful because this clarifies that the areas that we're concerned about here are those public areas accessible by tenants uh, in the building. So whenever a landlord plans to treat those areas where tenants could go, um, they will have to post a plan in the lobby. Um, if Councillor Fleury was suggesting that we expand the wording further with perhaps another friendly amendment uh, in the lobby or main entrance of an apartment building, that would give the landlord some flexibility to post that required notice either in the lobby or if there's no lobby, in the main entrance of the building. Um, I, I don't know if that addresses Councillor Fleury's comments, but willing to, um, to comment on it further. No, I, I just needed clarify. I, I was wondering what those words meant. So I think you've clarified that. Uh, and I think the intent is certainly uh, clear. Excellent. OK, thank you, Councillor Fleury. And so then on the Report in itself, the Rental Housing Property Management Bylaw Rental Accommodation Study Update. Is the report carried? Very carried. Fantastic. And a big thank you again to staff for the tremendous amount of work that in, went into this. I, you know, I think we've accomplished a lot here uh, in passing this report today, and I know it will be very impactful for renters across the city. So uh, our, my thanks. And um, so I would like uh, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, unfortunately, uh, Councillor Eglai was uh, running a bit late uh, for other duties, but I did want to give him a moment um, just to comment. There were two commemorative naming proposals um, that we've already carried that went through in his ward. I think he wanted to just speak on briefly. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that. Yeah, it was a combination of duties and some technical issues. 
uh, with my computer. Um, so I appreciate the, the few minutes. Um, first is the, uh, the George Br uh, Brancato uh, naming. And uh, for those of us of a certain age uh, in the city, uh, George uh, needs no introduction. Um, he, was, uh, he was a professional football player of note. And, uh, and uh, more importantly than that, he was a uh, uh, winning coach of the, uh, of the Rough Riders. Uh, he received coach of the year, CFL coach of the year, and, uh, and also uh, brought home a great cup for us. Uh, so um, it's, it's a well-deserved honor. Uh, George, the longtime resident of my area, I would see him uh, working out at the gym on a regular basis in the grocery store. And uh, it's nice that this park is directly adjacent to his home, backs onto it, and there's a real connection between him, his family, and that park. So thank you for passing that. The other, uh, the other um, park in, uh, isn't a park, but is a field, uh, a, a, and it also is football related. It's uh, uh, one of the fields at, uh, at Minto. Uh, Mitchell Sportsplex. Uh, it will be named after Sandy Ruxtell. And Sandy uh, uh, passed away in the last number of years, but he devoted more than 30 years of his life to amateur football uh, in, uh, in this city. And he was so engaged in it uh, and in supporting youth and sport that um, he was offered a, uh, a transfer and promotion to go work for, he was with the Federal Civil Service to go work in London, England. And he sat down, he said, I can't do that because I'll miss the football season. And uh, he stayed behind and he gave up that opportunity um, so he could be there for the kids. Um, uh, his motto was essentially that no kid would be left behind. So if there was a, some sort of a barrier to a child playing, he found a way to address that and to, uh, and to allow that child to play. And I, I can tell you from, from dealing with Sandy as, as the ward counselor on issues in and around um, uh, field maintenance and allocation and uh, anything to do with amateur sport. He was as tenacious uh, an opponent uh, around the conference table, advocating for those, those important issues for kids as he was, uh, whether he was uh, coaching or playing. Uh, so just thank you very much for allowing me to say a few, a few short words about both of these uh, uh, important namings. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Aglai. Uh, so going back to the agenda then, uh, moving on to item number two, which is the Accessibility Advisory Committee 2020 to 2022 work plan. Uh, we did have a speaker that was registered that I believe uh, had to leave, uh, but I believe uh, Councillor Luloff uh, in your capacity was going to uh, take that on. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know it's always awkward when a, a committee member uh, is uh, also provides comments, so I appreciate uh, uh, you allowing me to do this on behalf uh, of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. As uh, everyone on this committee has seen, I will always vigorously defend their role. They are absolutely incredible group of volunteers that add so much uh, to our city. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, on behalf of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, this was uh, originally prepared by Melanie Bernard, who is the vice chair of the AAC and does just incredible work with, uh, with Chair Turcott and the rest of the members. We thank the city staff for putting together our draft work plan for 2020-2022. Uh, committee members were happy to have the chance to discuss the plan at our meeting in February. We're excited to begin working on the issues identified in the work plan. The broad nature of the work plan is uh, evidence of how integral accessibility is to everything that the city does and how important the Accessibility Advisory Committee is. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, uh, this was prepared by Melanie, so I'm, I'm reading it in her words. I'm a relatively new member of this committee, which I suppose I am as well, uh, and it's first, uh, uh, and it's the first time I've been involved in this process of developing the committee's work plan. I was a bit surprised to discover that our work plan is prepared by staff who identify the topics they feel come up during our term. Our committee receives the work plan, but we don't have much opportunity to modify it. Some committee members feel that this work plan is more manageable than plans in previous years, given the AAC's limited number of meetings. Currently, we only meet for four times per year, in addition to a special meeting to consult on capital projects in the upcoming year. 
Nonetheless, we still feel that our committee should meet more frequently to be better able to fulfill our mandate and manage our workload. In between meetings, we receive a very high volume of advisory requests by email, asking us to comment on various technical design plans. These email requests don't always provide a sufficient context to be able uh, to enable the committee members to provide meaningful feedback. It would be more efficient and effective for us to discuss these requests at meetings instead of by email. If we are able to continue receiving this high volume of uh, sorry, if we are to continue uh, receiving this high volume of email requests, we need, to be we need better resources to be able to manage these requests. Finally, our committee is making a priority of better understanding the city's procedural frameworks. We would welcome the opportunity to work more closely with the Community and Protective Services Committee, our home standing committee. Thank you again so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And Melanie would have been very pleased to answer any questions uh, that, that you might have. And if uh, members of the committee do have questions, I will do my very best to answer them on her, on her behalf. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Councillor Luloff. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, does, uh, does anyone have any questions for staff on the work plan itself? Okay, not seeing any. I certainly appreciate uh, the comments that uh, he has submitted as vice chair and uh, always welcome uh, the opportunity to speak with them as I'm sure uh, Councillor Luloff uh, does as well in his capacity. Uh, to ensure they're able to meet uh, their mandate. I, I know it's a tremendous amount of work, uh, so certainly appreciate all that goes into the role. Uh, with that, is the report recommendation carried? Carried. 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 Excellent. Okay, so just going back to the agenda, uh, we've gotten through all of the reports. Uh, we have no in-camera items. We do have uh, one IPD uh, that was uh, circulated, which was the impacts of cannabis legalization on the City of Ottawa services. Uh, Councillor Fleury has indicated uh, an interest in uh, raising some questions on this. So in order to do so, we do need to have uh, the, the will of the committee uh, to lift the IPD. Is it the will of the committee to do so? Yes? Sure. Okay, excellent. Sure. So with that, uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ma uh, Madam Chair. And I, I wanna begin by thanking staff. The, uh, the IPD is quite, uh, quite informative of the various tangent and involvement and, um, and, um, and processes uh, that the city has undertaken. Um, I have three questions. Um, <clears throat> the, the first one relates to one of the elements that I believe is missing out of the report. And I, I wonder if we're able to have additional clarity ahead of council or, or, uh, or, off the, or, or if that could be communicated to committee. It relates to OPS, like we, we have no data. So it's a, it's a substantial impact of licensees of cannabis, but it doesn't speak on the OPS front of DUIs or if there's less drug incidents in Ottawa due to the legalization, which I believe would be of, of importance to, um, to, to council and, and public health and, and enforcement bodies. Uh, Madam Chair, um, the, the challenge always, uh, uh, as the request was to talk about the uh, financial elements, which we, we, we've, we've hopefully outline in the, uh, the journey that we took about change of governments and legislation. And I, and I thank the councillor for pointing out that uh, hopefully we did answer those questions so you had better context. The challenge we'll have with, with police always is the governance challenge. Um, um, the, the question was uh, strictly on the financial component and uh, whether the money we received from the province, how it was spent and how it was divided. Um, we don't have access to um, I think what you're looking for, council, that would have to go to the board for that type of question. Okay, I'll relate. I'll use the document and relate it to the board. Thank you. Uh, the uh, small two outstanding items is one of the, and I believe that's uh, that's the planning group, specifically uh, Mr. Wise, who's been assigned to uh, being the liaison to the AGCO. 
Um, I appreciate Council has set out a number of guidelines and principles that uh, we've all adopted. But one of the issues that's risen and I think uh, is missing is accessibility. So if you walk into any LCBO in Ontario, it is fully accessible because it is a public entity. By the fact that the cannabis stores are private, they're not upheld to the same accessibility regulations. And I wonder um, how, we are, how we plan to communicate that issue because we're, the city and I have raised it now. We have a bunch of applications specifically in my word, but they would apply in any community where the community has, has raised accessibility concerns. And uh, I'm not sure where to go with it. Um, Chair, uh, certainly don't have the expertise to, uh, to answer the question, but I, I'm more than willing to assist uh, Councillor Fleury to, um, to shepherd this through. I, I would think that perhaps uh, our colleague Steve Willis could perhaps help us out. Um, and I, I would imagine we'd have to go back to the province and start exploring that. So if, uh, Chair, if the Councillor wishes, we'll, uh, we'll follow offline with him and try to shepherd that through the, the, the process at the city to see if we can get some answers. And I see Councillor Lulov raising hand. I imagine of, in, of his interest, I'd, I'd be glad to work uh, with, with the two of you to uh, to advance that. Um, my, my, oh, sorry about that. Nope. nope, go ahead. I thought you were my done. Last one, and it'll be short. Uh, it may be uh, kind of a, a thing to think about. Uh, I was thinking of bringing a motion, but we have the principles that have been adopted by council. We have a report by staff saying uh, clearly the AGCO does not factor in any of the City of Ottawa staff recommendations. It's pretty clearly outlined in terms of proximity to park or separation distances. Um, should we not preface our participation uh, in those consultation with a, a, a one-liner at the beginning saying, our comments as a City of Ottawa have not appeared to matter? Because I, I, I don't think the AGCO has taken our concerns seriously as it relates to um, accessibility, proximity to parks, and separation distances. Mm -hmm. It's more of a comment. I'm not looking for a response from you, but you know, I, I do want to point out we do we do raise legitimate concerns, and the AGCO has not taken us seriously in in any of those, and and they're highlighted in that IPD. Yeah, and if I if I may, I I believe we're getting into kind of the the planning aspects, yeah, yeah. and uh, and obviously. Um, you know, we don't have the expertise here or, or does it fall within the mandate of this committee respecting the IPD does so uh, it's it's a bit of a it's I think it's a conversation to take offline uh, with with Stephen Willis and and those involved but I appreciate the comments. Uh, are there any other questions on the IPD? Not just seeing any. Just very briefly, Madam Chair, um, I think that, uh, you know, the councillors um, can can work very closely with the stopgap step up program um, that uh, is absolutely incredible for our local businesses that are looking to increase their accessibility using the uh, the maker space um, at city uh, city center I know that many of us have gone out uh, to volunteer with them to to build these custom custom steps um, that uh, that help with accessibility uh, for our local storefronts um, so if there are any of the um, uh, any of the cannabis retailers listening in today, I would strongly encourage you to to look into uh, the stopgap program. It is wonderful. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Agreed. Uh, excellent. So I don't see any other questions on uh, the IPD. Um, and now, Mark, for clarification process wise, we are receiving this, given we've lifted it. Yes. Okay. So is the memo, the IPD received? Received. Thank you. Okay. Are there any notices of motion for a subsequent meeting? Seeing none. Uh, any inquiries? I believe, yes. And Councillor Fleury? Yes, I, I am bringing an inquiry. I believe Councillor McKinney and, and Councillor Brockington were not able to stay, but they did uh, write an inquiry that I, I will read on their behalf. Uh, Councillor Brockington and Councillor McKinney will be submitting the following inquiry today. The summer of 2020 has been unreasonably hot with a number of temperature records broken. The city has offered cooling centers as an inconsist 
on an inconsistent basis with ge geographic gaps in services and not opening centers when the Umidex exceeded 40 degrees Celsius. Will the city manager confirm that the criteria used to open a cooling center will be reviewed, revised, and presented to the CPS to CPS committee for approval prior to summer of 2021. Okay. Um, and um, I think perhaps it might be worthwhile just to ask uh, Tony as we're receiving this inquiry for uh, for his uh, initial thoughts or comments. Um, the, uh, Madam Chair, as the members of, are not here, I, I was raising it on their behalf. I, okay. I don't know. Um, uh, Mr. DeMonte's intervention, if, if, if he can follow up with them directly, because I'm just raising it on their behalf. I, I defer to you, Madam Chair. I guess the question is, yes, there are some challenges with the uh, with the thing, and so we'd have to talk to the members. So I don't know how you want to manage. Are you are you putting it, it's, I know it's a notice, but is it forward? And the, sure. the whole concept of the city manager. So I defer to you uh, with regards to that. But Sure. I can so it is, uh, it's an inquiry. So I, I will, will table it as it is. Thank you, Councillor Fleury, for bringing it forward. Um, my thoughts were just that we're still in summer, but I guess we're near the end and hopefully we don't have any more heat waves in the next few weeks. Uh, but no, I appreciate it. Uh, any other inquiries to raise? Okay, any other business? And on adjournment, carried. Very good, thank you. So our next meeting will be September 17th. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Merci.